So, good afternoon, everybody. Let's please get seated so we can start on time. So, uh, the session this afternoon is about current CMB experiments, and the first talk is by Suzanne Staggs, who will tell us about high angular resolution measurements of the CMB. seem to make a difference. Is it, is it on? Can you hear me now? Uh, maybe you want to use this one instead. Uh, I suppose the volume could be down. It was on mute. Oh, cool. <laughs> But it's better if you have it in the middle instead of having it on one side, because if you turn your head on the other side, nobody hears you. Yeah, well. But it's on now? Yes, it's now much better. Thank you. All right. Yes, we hear you. Excellent. Uh, right, so, um, voici mes mots d'or. I used gold font for. Um, for all my many of the titles uh, in celebration of Cosmo Gold. So um, I was given this title, as I hear many people um, here were assigned the title. So uh, here it is, Current Large Aperture Ground-Based CMB Experiments. Um, so here's a photographs of uh, several of the large aperture CMB telescopes that exist currently. They're photographs, that's how you can tell they actually exist. Um, you could ask yourself what makes an aperture large, so I decided for the purposes of this meeting it would be larger than Planck, so I wouldn't need to include results from Planck, um, but really it probably means larger than L of about four or 500, capable of achieving an L of that size. Um, so uh, those are the currently existing um, instruments, which I'll go into in a bit of detail in the following slides. So there's SPT at the South Pole, Simon Array and ACT um, in the Atacama Desert, and actually uh, to include all current-ish experiments, um, I, would uh, I need to add in the Simons Observatory Large Aperture Telescope, or LAT. And so all of these, these well, that's not a photo, but the rest of the photos are roughly to scale. Uh, this is a, a 10 meter mirror, these are two and a half meter mirrors, and both ACT and Simon's Observatory are six meter mirrors. Um, so I'm going to go through them in alphabetical order, but turns out to put ACT first. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, I, I'm deeply involved with ACT, but I'm also quite involved with Simon's Observatory, but um, not with Simon's Array slash polar bear, nor with uh, um, SPT. So um, the ACT collaboration is pretty big, uh, has many institutions and uh, um, around 80 collaborators. Um, it, like I said, it's sited in uh, uh, the Atacama Desert in Chile, where it's at 5,200 meters elevation. Um, it's, it's a desert, so it's quite dry most of the time, and it's at a latitude of minus 23 degrees, which compared to the South Pole is pretty far north. Um, it, it's a six meter off axis telescope, being six meters gives it arc minute resolution, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. It's an off axis uh, Gregorian, as are most of the other telescopes I'll be mentioning. Here's a slightly closer view of it. It's made out of 72 individual panels. Um, that's a view of it. That's the receiver, which is looking to the secondary and then down to the primary. Um, so the, uh, the ACT pole advanced ACT camera uh, is um, novel compared to the other instruments, except for Simon's Observatory, in that it uses a dilution refrigerator, so the detectors run at less than 100 millikelvin, which gives them a small um, advantage in 
sensitivity, but it also means that the instrument just runs and runs and runs. That's how dilution fridges work. They don't have to be recycled. And it's true, we've been running a dilution fridge there since 2007, and most of the time it just runs and runs and runs. It turns out as it gets older, you have to take really good care of it or that won't be true, but we're now doing that. Um, so uh, ACT has these three separate um, uh, detector arrays and, and optical chains with lenses that go to them. It uses transition edge sensors, as do all the other instruments. Um, and uh, it has uh, frequency bands at um, 90 gigahertz, 150 gigahertz, and 220 gigahertz. And sitting on the shelf, we have an array that works simultaneously at 30 and 40 gigahertz, but it's so sensitive because the atmosphere is so small there that we are leaving it on the shelf so that we don't have to do a lot of changes of the instrument. So we're gonna only run with it for one year. And these are the beam sizes that we get at those various frequency bands. This uh, is a hit map of the coverage that Advanced ACT has had and ACT poll. Um, we are now looking in at this very large survey region, which is a little more than 40% of the sky in uh, the region that you're seeing. And these um, places where we have more sensitivity, those are from earlier surveys from, from ACPOL. Okay, moving on alphabetically to the polar bear collaboration. Again, it's another really large um, collaboration. Uh, and um, uh, the, its PI is Adrian Lee, so he gave me a number of slides for this. Um, if you take polar bears and add them all together, you get Simon, a Simon's array. Um, so there are three telescopes, um, uh, each of which is a two and a half meter mirror, so it has a re resolution of about three and a half arc minutes at 150 gigahertz. Um, among the uh, instruments, it, it covers uh, 90 to 280 gigahertz. There's this you know, thing where one uses shorthands for the um, detector band centers, and I get named slightly different things. Um, this picture, which uh, Adrian gave me, uh, the telescopes weren't quite installed, but um, John Groh also gave me some slides, and uh, they, the telescopes are all now um, installed, and the PB2A receiver, the first of the new receivers, um, beyond the original polar bear, um, has received uh, first light. Um, and uh, these are um, uh, some uh, design goals that the instrument set out to uh, try to meet. Um, here's a, a bit more of a slide from John Groh, just uh, somewhat analogous to the slide I showed for ACT, just showing uh, the off-axis uh, Gregorian nature of the telescope. Um, it also has uh, mul multiple lenses. It, it, uh, these large aperture telescopes um, have gone that way. And it also uses these large six inch arrays, but more of them. Um, and uh, it uses a slightly different type of transition edge sensor um, coupled detector. Okay, so then moving on to the Simons Observatory collaboration, guess what? Also a really large collaboration. And in fact, this is the union of the ACT and, and Simon's Array teams, plus others, some of whom are here. Um, and uh, it, it was made possible by a, a generous grant from the Simon's Foundation and also from the Heising Simon's Foundation and also from a number of, of uh, universities um, and other institutions. So um, the Simon's Observatory is also going to be located where on the same, um, plateau where ACT and polar bear are, and there's another instrument class, but it doesn't fall under my purview because it's a small instrument. Uh, uh, but this is a you know, Google Maps view, and Simon's Observatory will fall in here. So there are some small aperture telescopes I'm not mentioning, uh, and then there's a large aperture telescope that will sit over here. So everybody will be neighbors. Um, so. Uh, the, yes, so Simon's Observatory has this one lat for high L science and then other instruments to try to look for low L science. Here are the um, specs on the lat. This, uh, these numbers can also be found in um, our forecasting paper uh, whose coordinates are given here. Um, so you can see that since it is a, a six uh, 
meter primary mirror, it has very similar uh, uh, um, re angular resolutions to ACT, which was also a six meter mirror. And this is giving some estimates um, for the noise in the maps after five years where you plan to survey a, a really large region of the sky similar to what was in advanced ACT uh, in a five-year period that'll be roughly in the region 2022 to 2027. On, on the books, it starts a little earlier than that. Um, so it's a novel telescope uh, in that it has two large mirrors, both of which are about six meters in size, but the primary is the one that's six meters. This is the cross Dragoni um, configuration that allows for a really, really huge focal plane that you can pack with lots and lots of, of detectors. All right, so then alphabetically last uh, is the South Pole Telescope, um, which, by the way, I'm gonna have slides. Uh, um, John Carlstrom, Tom Crawford, and Brad Benson gave me a bunch of slides, so just look for that little uh, notice in the corner. Um, so it's a, a 10 meter um, telescope with uh, sub-millimeter quality panels. I'd say the same is true for ACT. Um, uh, it, it's also made out of a number of different small panels. Um, it uh, has been operating at three, in three different frequency bands, and you can see the um, resolutions that are achieved here. You'll note they're actually quite similar to the resolutions from ACT as well, and that's because of the way the instrument is fed to protect it from having, I think, to protect it from having uh, um, lots and lots of, of side lobes. Um, there have been a series of different cameras uh, installed on SPT, um, and each one is associated with different surveys, which are shown in the next slide. Um, and there's been a steady increase um, in the number of detectors. Well, actually, it wasn't that steady. It got a little bit bigger in 2012, and now they have this really phenomenally gigantic focal plane um, that's uh, installed and running. So the SPT surveys um, uh, are, are shown here. So this is the SPT SZ survey, so the one that's shown in, in yellow here. And then um, here are some stats on the uh, data that are, have been taken so far. Um, the main deep and summer fields. Um, uh, and then SPT3G uh, has started taking data and will run for five years. And, uh, uh, you know, so these numbers for it are only um, projected, while the numbers up here are presumably known reasonably well so far. Uh, okay, so that was the quick intro to the actual um, instruments that are out there. And then I was just going to say a few words about how, uh, you know, why you want to have this extra resolution and how far we've um, gotten in taking advantage of it so far, where we means that all of, the, all of these instruments together. So this is a just fun demonstration, hope probably some of you have seen it before, um, of, of uh, this optimal combination of the Planck and ACT maps that Sigurd Ness has made. It's not yet that. This is just a, a chunk of the Planck map that's around 100 square degrees. And then you can blink it to the ACT map, which is <laughs> pretty boring because it's been um, filtered. So um, it, it has only its um, high L content. Um, but then the lovely thing that Sigurd has done is uh, this nice method of combining the two maps so that you get all the good from each map by doing a weighting that depends on the um, modal content in, in small regions of the, um, of the map. And so you can just blink between them and you get all these freckles and whatnot showing up, which are sources. And I can't remember if there's an actual cluster in here, but um, it's a beautiful thing and soon he'll write a paper on it. Um, uh, and then a, a further thing that uh, uh, some of our younger colleagues have done, oh, I forgot to put their photos here, but Colin Hill, Matt Matavashrol, and um, working with Sigurd, have made this uh, lovely um, uh, constrained ILC map that um, uh, starts with this optimal combination of data from ACT and, and Planck. And this is, a, this is their Compton Y map, um, 
And you see, I actually, they sent it around, and I'm like, what is wrong with the map? Why does it have that giant red fuzzy thing in it? And that's a cluster, because it's a Y map, so clusters look red. And it looks big and fuzzy because it's so nearby, which in the ACT data, we can't usually, we can't find things that are big and fuzzy like that. And of course, you can in Planck, so um, possibly we get the best of both worlds here. Okay, so just a quick rundown. I know lots of people have already talked about why these things are good or we'll be talking about them later. But so the, the sort of main uh, aspects of advantages from the resolution would be, you know, you can get lensing and lensing cross-correlation data. You can look at the small-scale damping tail of the CMB. You can do blind cluster surveys using the Sinai's Eldovich effect. You can um, stack on other data's knowledge of where groups and clusters are to try to understand what the CMB, uh, the Sunni Zeldovich and other signatures look like in those data. Um, and you can look for the effect of the kinematic SC effect, which um, helps you uh, be sensitive to the velocity fields in the universe and not just the density fields. So here is a uh, the most recent um, lensing plot uh, um, showing results from SPT poll, 500 days. Um, and just in general, I think, you know, a lovely thing about these lensing plots is uh, how much um, data we have now, where Planck really, um, really got things kicked off uh, for us. And, and now the ground-based experiments are, are um, starting to have comparable sensitivity as um, this note says here. And also for the SPT data, uh, the polarization data added more constraint than the temperature data um, for them, which is the direction that we all are hoping that we're moving. So that's exciting. Um, ACT has results in the works too. Uh, Wayne was asking me just exactly when those were coming out. Uh, so <laughs> they're coming out this summer. Um, and then SO um, has projections for doing very, very well on the lensing as well with a signal to a noise of greater to one on every single mode um, less than 200. Um, uh, I think you already saw a better plot of this today from Luca, this idea before, but uh, there's a lot to be seen by looking um, in high resolution uh, at, the, at the primary CMB um, to uh, try to detangle a number of effects that could be uh, creeping into that um, damping tail and uh, uh, th this is showing um, that as of recently, the SPT poll constraints um, are dominating at L greater than approximately 1,000. We've been kind of bouncing back and forth between ACT and SPT, and we're going to bounce back in there pretty soon with ACT because we're about to have a, more, a, a data release coming really soon. Um, but the point being that uh, you, there, there is still um, part of even the primary CMB that can be probed post-Planck by having more um, uh, resolution. And this is from the forecasting paper for SO, just highlighting um, uh, constraints on two of the effects that uh, can leave their signatures in the damping tail region. So this an effective parameter, which famously uh, could reveal light relics. Um, I think you'll hear lots about that on Thursday. Um, and uh, um, constraints on, on H naught and our, our estimates for how well we could do. We have, the paper presents both baseline and goal, and as you can see, the goal numbers are better than the baseline numbers. So the baseline are the sort of, um, in NASA speak, they're the, uh, what we, um, believe that we're going to reach, but they're slightly higher than our threshold, which would be, we'll just stop the project if we don't reach the threshold. Baseline is somewhat better than that. Okay, so um, just historically, th these are the first um, clusters detected in a blind survey um, by SPT back in the day. And then here is um, uh, also from this SPT poll data here, um, They've now found uh, significantly more clusters than their orig original 500 or so. So they're up to uh, more than 1,000 um, clusters where this is plotting um, the mass versus redshift. Similarly, ACT, um, we have such a huge area, almost all of which is covered by optical surveys, that um, we have uh, 
also been able to find quite a few clusters, something like uh, 1,500 confirmed clusters. These blue and green outlines are the SDSS and DES footprints. Um, that, and so the, the, those data can be used to um, uh, uh, confirm clusters um, quickly. And this is showing our plot of M versus Z, which I didn't um, attempt to combine with the SPT poll data because <coughs> Um, and then, so moving on just to one more cool thing, you know, when you have high resolution, you can, you can stack on, um, for example, luminous red galaxies, which if you think they're in the centers of groups, or other um, things such as uh, quasars, if you're attempting to probe um, a family of quasar hosts. I'm not out of time, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm almost done, so it's good. Um, so. It, you know, one thing that uh, we've done with ACT was uh, an analysis where we uh, were able to use the lensing of the CMB itself to measure a mean mass of clusters in such, such a stack, groups or clusters. Um, and uh, that was by Metabash Rolinol um, in 2015. And uh, uh, another thing that we, and see, I told you I was just gonna ignore Planck. Planck's done these things too. But you know, Planck is not a large after telesc telescope by my definition. Um, so, because uh, 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 another thing that's mentioned here is, is uh, one can try to look at the um, spectral energy distributions of um, quasar host systems, um, and by looking at how much. Uh, um, by looking at this range of frequencies where you get into the very dusty um, submillimeter bands, but you also have the um, CMB uh, bands, you can fit for combinations of, of the Compton Y parameter and various uh, environmental parameters that describe the dust and, in, in principle, um, even the synchrotron emission. And uh, so that's done here by combining ACT data with Herschel data. And this is just one of the several redshift bins, but the, and this is a, a stack on many, many quasars. Um, and uh, uh, so that's cool. So it's a way that you can use the CMB data to try to understand um, things that are kind of like astrophysics, you know, energy and winds from the, from the uh, accreting supermassive black holes. But it also can tell you something about galaxy formation and the importance of feedback, and that can tell you a little bit uh, well, we're going to hear a lot about what you can learn from clusters. So this may or may not be able to inform all that knowledge about clusters. And finally, uh, for the KSC, I, I really, I was excited to talk about this. And then I see we're going to have our own um, talk by one of the authors of this really fabulous paper that I advise everyone to go read, even though I picked a very boring plot out of it. Um, it's just a great paper describing very clearly um, what the point is of, of uh, of combining KSC data with, um, with other, uh, sorry, what it, it, what it is to probe the KSC by combining CMB data with galaxy data. Um, and, but, uh, but the point is, at high L, the kinematic SC effect dominates the spectrum if you're a theorist and didn't put any point sources in there. Um, but uh, it, it's, it's not a small signal, and, and um, uh, my colleague, Erminia Calabresi, um, was one of several to uh, uh, think through how helpful it is to have polarization data. And this is a, a plot from her paper describing um, that you can predict the primordial um, uh, uh, CMB temperature spectrum from the Planck low L data and also the high L polarization data. And from that, you can predict what the high L um, temperature data should look like. And then you can remove all of that primordial effect. And then what is left would ideally be the um, KSC uh, power spectrum. Uh, so, so far, um, the measurements of the KSC are at the few sigma level. Um, but they're, they're, they've been at the few sigma level for a um, uh, uh, number of different um, projects, so that's good. <laughs> um, I just paused because I left out a really nice plot from Simon's Array. Sorry, Simon's Array has uh, uh, recently 
um, made a measurement using um, lensing calculated just from polarization cross correlated with HSC weak lensing. It's quite nice. Uh, it's Namikaze et al. You should go look at it. I should add it to the slides afterwards. Um, so uh, then here, here's a, a, a plot of, of uh, um, aspirational things for Simon's Observatory uh, um, to do with KSZ. Um, so uh, the KSC measures the um, momentum um, of the cluster. So momentum has uh, mass in it as well as velocity. And of course, it's ideal to uh, be looking at the um, velocity to, to, to suck all the cosmology out of it. And so to, to do that, you have to have some way of estimating the mass. And so that, that's the mass of the electrons, which are the ones participating. And so you need a cluster optical depth estimate. And so that's the difference between these sets of curves for these estimates of the growth rate of structure from Simon's Observatory. Um, and then this is just saying some bonus data from high resolution CMB. Uh, for example, SPT discovered this amazing population of really high redshift lens dusty star forming galaxies. And some cool stuff was done afterwards to look at the uh, structure of dark matter um, using those. Uh, SPT is part of the Event Horizon Telescope, and that's our picture of the black hole for the day. Um, and they put constraints on millimeter wave transients. Uh, from ACT, we discovered the El Gordo cluster, which uh, uh, Hubble has uh, and, and, um, and X-ray astronomers have uh, spent some time um, being uh, interested in as well. Um, we we re recently issued our first astronomer's telegram um, on a strongly flaring blazar. Um, and uh, we've put out a number of, of um, source catalogs on AGN and, and DSFGs. So that's it. That's all I had to say. So thanks. <laughs> Those are my postdocs. They're all great. <laughs> Thank you very much. Questions? George. So how accurately can you get absolute calibration? Just closer to your mouth. Oh, sorry? Just closer to your mouth. Oh, closer to my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> right. How accurately can you get polarization calibration, absolute calibration, you know, measuring your polarization efficiencies and so on? Um, well, we're, we're using Planck to get no, the... No, you can't. We don't know the polarization. No, no, we, we're using. Sorry, I was going to say we're using Planck to get the absolute calibration of okay. the temperature. Yeah. And then from that, we're constructing our polarization calibration, uh, and we're estimating that we're getting it almost as, as accurately as we get the as we get the temperature. Fifty percent, as good. One and a half times as good, say. So, you know, one and a half percent multiplied by a smallish, a number that's not that different than one. Uh, okay, more questions? Uh, uh, okay. So, how many hours of data ACT and SPT have, and when they are going to make it public? Pardon? Uh, like, how many hours of data SPT and ACT already have taken? Oh. Uh, you know, 10 years, but ACT has made everything public so far that we've had any papers on. And, and I think SPT has as well. Oh. And along with, uh, I mean, actual maps, map products are public. Yeah. So AP, ACT makes maximum likelihood maps, so they're very easy to use <laughs> once we've made them. <laughs> so. Yes, I have a question about uh, merging of. Uh, data between two instruments. You say that you use Planck or you merge Planck plus, plus ACT uh, data. What is the plan? Do you plan to, uh, is the plan is it uh, to use the Planck as a template of large scale? Or is it a real map making in such a way that you expect to decrease uh, the s instrumental systematic effect by uh, doing a, map, a common map making between the two instruments? Not sure I caught the whole question, but we are like we're taking the power spectrum of the ACT alone maps. Yeah. So our power spectrum data are done on the ACT alone maps. We're investigating, but we find the ACT plus Planck maps are are um, 
Well, they're pretty to look at, and they're really, we think they're gonna be really good for the Compton Y map in particular. Um, so uh, we're investigating whether they're the maps that we would want to use to do lensing analyses. Um, so we have to, yeah, investigate. Can I rephrase? I think what he's alluding to is going all the way back to pretty much raw data and have a joint solution that includes systematics from both instruments as well as a cosmology solution. So it's, it's, I think what Jean-Marc was talking about is are there any plans to actually do that, which is joint solution, including the systematics. If I may, I think that's. Yeah. Um, so it probably like, like everyone else, we're not at all adverse to it. It's, uh, it's the problem that, um, you know, we, ha we have ACT and then we're moving into Simon's Observatory. So it's the problem of having people who are expert enough to explain the TODs, uh, explain or define them. So we don't have real concrete plans on doing that. Hmm. However, someone embedded in the ACT could do it. You hint. know, some plonk people hmm. who <laughs> could Hint, embed. hint. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, I think we're out of time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next talk is John Kovac, who's going to tell us about small aperture CMB experiments.
Thank you, John. So I, I'll take uh, one question. Interferometry scientifically. So, like, what what are the advantages of bolometric interferometry, and what can you learn that you can't use with more standard techniques? That's oh, well, yeah. If someone has a better question. extrapolating uh, the techniques we've been using. Um. Okay. Thank you, John. I think there will be plenty of time at coffee break for more questions to you. So let's thank John again. <laughs> and um, So the next talk will be by Anthony Chalinar about CMB lensing statistics. Status. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> You can see my talk backwards now, hang on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You've actually seen most of it this morning anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, so I was asked uh, to review um, the, the status of CMB lensing. Uh, and as I said, actually, a lot of the material I'm going to present has been mentioned. And in fact, many of the pictures you'll recognize from things you've seen earlier in the day. Um, but what I'll try and do is package it all together uh, to give you a sort of status report of where we're at um, and a little bit of a flavour of where we're going in the future. Um, <clears throat> okay, so just to remind you, uh, the microwave background is released at the surface of last scattering uh, and then propagates through the entire observable universe. Uh, and in doing so, it's gravitationally lensed by large-scale structure. Um, and... <clears throat> um, the, the typical sizes uh, of the lenses that are involved here are uh, basically set by the peak in the matter power spectrum, so they're essentially 100 megaparsec scale uh, structures. Um, and um, the, uh, you know, if you imagine putting lenses at all distances here, the lensing efficiency is greatest when, in terms of co-moving distance, you're halfway between uh, the source plane uh, and the observation plane. And that corresponds to uh, a redshift of about two. So we're sensitive to these very large-scale lenses uh, at high redshift. Um, and this actually, amongst all lensing probes, uh, currently makes CMB lensing rather unique. So if you just work this through, uh, you expect small deflections, a couple of arc minutes in size, but they should be coherent over several degrees on the sky. OK, so the basic thing uh, that determines the deflections, at least in the Born approximation, um, is that uh, you know, the deflection is, is the gradient of some scalar field, and that scalar field, which we'll call the lensing potential, little phi, is just some integral uh, of the gravitational potentials weighted by some lensing efficiency factors and then integrated all the way back along the line of sight. Um, the power spectrum of that potential, um, or actually L to the fourth times the power spectrum of that potential, to give you something that's essentially a convergence power spectrum, is shown here. So the black line is just what you calculate from linear perturbation theory. The red dash line, which is almost indistinguishable on large scales, uh, but is a little bit larger than the black line on small scales, includes the corrections from the nonlinear matter power spectrum. <clears throat> 
So what you should take away from this plot is that, uh, and Martin alluded to this this morning, is that with CMB lensing, uh, over the region where we really have any signal to noise, we're working in the perturbative regime. Um, so nonlinear corrections, uh, although not negligible, uh, are fairly straightforward to model. Okay, this we did see uh, this morning. Uh, this is just showing, um, this is a slide originally made by Duncan Hansen, just showing the effects of lensing on the microwave background. So just to orient you, we've got the temperature, uh, E-mode polarization, uh, and B-modes uh, if there were no primordial gravitational waves. And then when you lens them, uh, things get displaced around, and <clears throat> there's a number of effects uh, that we can then try and pull out um, in the data uh, due to, to lensing. Um, so first of all, thinking about the temperature and also the E-mode polarization, um, the first thing that happens is that you smooth the acoustic peaks out. And that's just this fact that in some parts of the sky, the sky is being magnified. Uh, in some parts, it's being demagnified. Um, so that rather precisely defined sound horizon that's imprinted in the primary CMB fluctuations is expanded in regions where the sky is magnified, and it's contracted in regions where it's demagnified. And the effect of that uh, is to blur out uh, the acoustic peak structure. So as we've seen, this, is, this effect is, uh, uh, you know, you have to model it uh, to interpret the Planck data, and we routinely do that. What's more interesting for the purpose of this talk is that lensing introduces non-Gaussianity as well. So you're taking the essentially Gaussian primordial fluctuations, and then you're displacing them by a field which is also close to Gaussian. Um, but the resulting perturbative corrections to the CMB sky are then non-Gaussian, because they're essentially quadratic in two Gaussian fields. And it's, we use this non-Gaussianity to actually pull the lensing effects out of the microwave background in a way I'll describe in a second. The other thing that's important for this talk um, is that uh, E-modes get converted into B-modes by lensing. So E-mode polarization, remember, is a very specific geometric characterization, um, it, it, a very specific geometric orientation of the polarization and the way it varies over the sky. And lensing preserves the polarization directions, but it remaps the points. And in doing so, it can leak some of this E-mode signal uh, into B-modes. And if you're interested uh, in looking for primordial B-modes to constrain, for example, gravitational waves from inflation, we're getting to the point where we have to worry about this B-mode lensing signal. Okay, <clears throat> so it's usual to, to uh, sort of frame uh, discussions of, of the science that we do with lensing in terms of lens reconstruction. So this is the idea that just by taking the observed lens CMB sky, we can reconstruct the effects of lensing. And <clears throat> this is just a heuristic picture for, for how this works. And I'll give you a slightly more precise picture on the next slide. Um, but imagine you have a, a small region of the sky, uh, and you consider lenses which are large compared to that part of the sky. So <clears throat> uh, in that patch, it might be the case that it's typically an overdense patch, uh, in which case uh, lensing will tend to magnify things. So <clears throat> things will look larger on angular scale. And if you make a local power spectrum measurement here, uh, things will move uh, to the left. Another part of the sky, uh, where, where say there's an underdensity, uh, things will be demagnified, things will look smaller in angular scale, and the power spectrum locally measured will move to the right. So basically, by making these little power spectrum measurements in different patches of the sky, um, you, and, and sort of comparing to the mean over the sky, uh, you can figure out what the convergence in each field is doing. And in fact, you can go beyond that. You can also use the shear information, which introduces um, anisotropies in the locally measured uh, power spectrum. And we can combine both of those together uh, to reconstruct the lensing effects. In practice, the way this works uh, is that we use uh, quadratic estimators that were uh, first introduced by Wayne Hu, who's here, and, and, and collaborators. Um, so the idea is that in the presence of fixed uh, lenses, um, if you imagine, you can't do this in practice, but imagine you were able to average out the, the primary CMB fluctuations what you would find is that you get statistically anisotropic correlations in the CMB. Um, and that just means that modes at different multipoles L and M become correlated, and they're correlated because of uh, the, the presence of lensing. So using this, uh, you can construct estimators which are quadratic in the observed CMB fields uh, and use those to, to reconstruct the lensing potential. Um, so the details of this aren't important. Uh, there's some geometric 
coupling term, uh, which is just the sort of spherical analog uh, of a delta function. Um, but the important thing is you, you take a pair of CMB fields, and these can be temperature or polarization. Uh, you inverse variance weight them uh, to make the estimate more optimal, uh, and then you combine them in such a way. So you're taking two CMB fields, uh, convolving them in some way to pull out the CMB lensing. Now, this, this technique of reconstruction is inherently statistical, right? So even if the CMB isn't lensed, um, if we go back to that heuristic picture I had earlier, you might have some bits of the sky where just because of a chance cosmic variance fluctuation, things look magnified, and somewhere else they look demagnified. And this introduces a statistical noise. And this is just showing the level of that noise on the convergence power spectrum for Planck. So the signal we're trying to measure is this solid line here, and then uh, the various lines above that are showing the noise levels uh, for different uh, quadratic combinations of the data. So for Planck, uh, just because we don't have very much sensitivity in polarization, uh, the temperature, temperature combination dominates. So that's this red line. But you can improve things a little bit on large scales by including polarization information as well. And the optimal combination of these I'll refer to as the minimum variance estimate. Uh, and that's this, this sort of gray line at the bottom of this, this plot. So if you compare the noise level to the signal, uh, you can see that we're not really signal dominated anywhere. Um, but there's a significant number of modes with signal to noise of order one on large angular scales. OK, so how can we use uh, CMB lensing? Um, well, the most obvious thing you can do is if you've reconstructed this, this phi field, you can correlate it with itself. Um, <clears throat> so ultimately, given that phi is a quadratic combination of the temperature or the polarization fields, um, when you take it, the auto power spectrum of reconstruction, you're, you're probing a CMB four-point function. And uh, this is uh, known to be a, a very good way to, for example, test lambda CDM. Uh, a good way to constrain neutrino masses, uh, etc. Instead of correlating with itself, you could correlate with some other tracer of large-scale structure. And Martin gave some nice examples of that uh, this morning in his talk. Um, so there, you're correlating lensing reconstructed from the CMB with large-scale structure. So that's actually a three-point measurement. And the sort of things you can do with this are, because you can correlate with a sort of tomographic uh, large-scale structure survey, you can probe the way that structure is growing throughout the universe in redshift. Um, it's a very good way to mitigate systematic effects because you're correlating something derived from the CMB with a completely independent measurement from large-scale structure. Um, it's a good way to self-calibrate, um, and uh, it's also a very good probe of astrophysics, for example, the bias of halos. Another important application that I alluded to earlier uh, is this idea of delensing B modes. Um, so what we're trying to do here uh, is basically remove uh, the effect of uh, B modes that are generated by lensing to try and improve our inflationary constraints. Um, and then finally, we can actually look for the lensing of individual halos, um, and in particular use this, for example, to calibrate the masses of galaxy clusters at high redshift. So in the rest of this talk, uh, I'll just review some of our uh, status of where we've got to with some of these science goals. Uh, in particular, I'm going to focus on these three. Uh, there'll be a lot more discussions about this later in the week. Um, and then, uh, as I said, I'll look at some of the, uh, the future prospects and challenges. Just before I do that, let me just say a few words about comparisons with galaxy lensing, though, uh, because uh, obviously in this conference we've, we've got CMB people and large-scale structure people familiar with galaxy lensing. Um, so one of the negatives of CMB lensing is you have a single source plane, right? It's the last scattering surface. Um, so you see everything in projection. Um, so if you want to do anything tomographic and see how things are changing in redshift, you've got to cross-correlate with something. However, so that, that's a bad thing. Uh, but the good thing um, is that uh, because we have a single source plane and we understand its physics very, very well, there are no issues of photometric redshift errors in CMB lensing. <clears throat> the source plane is very, very high, um, so we're probing structure in the linear regime at high redshift. We understand the statistics of that source plane very, very well. And, for example, that means we can use both shear and convergence information, <clears throat> uh, whereas galaxy lensing typically just uses, uses shear. There's no in intrinsic alignment issues, at least if you're just looking at the autospectrum, 
Um, and there are no issues with actually trying to measure the shapes uh, of individual fluctuations or galaxies. Okay, so let me just run through some of the current lens reconstructions. Uh, so this is what we saw this morning. This is the Planck uh, latest 2018 minimum variance reconstruction. So this is combining temperature and polarization. I should say nearly all of the Planck results I'm going to show uh, were derived by Julian Caron, uh, who's a really exceptional postdoc at Sussex. So this is, you know, a full sky uh, map. This is actually 70% of the sky that's shown here, projecting all the matter in the universe back to, to last scattering. <clears throat> the Planck reconstruction, as I showed earlier, is actually dominated by temperature. Um, so this is showing what you get if you just use the temperature information, um, and this is what you get if you just use polarization. And because these maps have been filtered, uh, the noisy modes are filtered out, um, so you see very little small-scale information in this polarization map where it will be very noisy. <clears throat> um, of course, we, can't just, we don't just do reconstructions from, uh, from the Planck data. Ground-based experiments have also been doing this. Um, so this is an example from ACTPOL. <clears throat> um, what they've published so far is actually just this map uh, from Blake Sherwin's 2017 paper, uh, which is combining data in this D56 small field here. Uh, using data from the 13 and 2014 seasons. Um, but they have a whole load more data that they're now processing. Um, so this is just a very preliminary reconstruction from this large Boss North field. And um, as Suzanne said, uh, now with Advanced Act, they're doing a ginormous survey, 16,000 square degrees uh, in this region uh, in five frequency bands. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, this will be a very exciting uh, data set to see these large-scale reconstructions from... Uh, with sensitivity much, much higher than Planck. SPT have recently re uh, released uh, results. Uh, so this is from uh, SPT poll data at 150 gigahertz, over 500 square degrees. And this is a temperature-based reconstruction, so just using the TT quadratic estimator. And this is just polarization, so just quadratic estimators using only polarization. Um, and the really nice thing about the SPT data is that they've reached a sensitivity where they're actually getting more signal-to-noise from polarization than they do in, uh, in temperature in lensing. Um, so, you know, this map is actually higher fidelity than this temperature map. Um, and these maps are much more sensitive than, than Planck. Uh, here's their power spectrum plot uh, showing their noise levels. Again, here's the signal. And they've got all these high signal-to-noise modes here uh, that, that we didn't have in, in Planck. But of course, it's only covering a small patch of the sky. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, SPT has grand plans moving forward. Uh, SPT 3G is on the sky. Uh, they're going to survey 1,500 square degrees down to a depth of about four microkelvin arc minute. Um, so, uh, you know, that, that again will be, uh, you know, uh, there'll, there'll be many, many high signal to noise lensing modes that will come from that data set, and it'll be dominated by polarization. Okay, so let me say a little bit about uh, the power spectrum uh, measurements of lensing so far and how we can derive parameters from them. Um, so a lot of this has all been covered, uh, so I'll go pretty fast. Um, this is uh, from the Planck 2018 uh, paper um, showing uh, the Planck data points uh, as these rectangles, uh, the pink ones being the most recent 2018 results. Uh, the other points are from ground-based measurements, and then the black line um, is what you expect the lensing signal to be in the Lander CDM model, not calibrated from this data, uh, but calibrated from the primary CMB and isotropies themselves. Um, so what you can see is, you know, there's a very nice, uh, nice fit, and it's a beautiful story. Uh, we calibrate things at redshift of 1,000, we propagate down to redshift 2, uh, and we see structures at the expected level. So this is a 40 sigma detection of CMB lensing. <coughs> Um, those SPT maps that I showed earlier, um, if you form their power spectrum, um, you get these, these points here. Um, and the point I want to make is that if you compare the different colors, um, the black is the minimum variance combination, blue is polarization only, uh, red uh, is temperature only, and the error bars are smaller from polarization than temperature. So the polarization is more constraining in this data set just because the sensitivity is much higher. <clears throat> okay, so we can try and constrain cosmological parameters directly from the, the lensing measurements. 
And uh, lensing depends basically on three parameters, sigma 8, omega matter, and H0. And in fact, because for CMB lensing, the, the, the lenses are at such high redshift, you're actually really only sensitive to two parameters. Um, you can phrase this in terms of the primordial amplitude, AS, and a parameter that's related to Martin's favorite parameter, K equality. Uh, the relevant thing here uh, is basically the angular size that, the, uh, that K equality subtends uh, at the last scattering surface. So because of that, uh, in three-dimensional space, you get quite a tight uh, degeneracy um, shown by this swathe of, of colored points here. And uh, that's very effectively broken by baryon acoustic oscillation measurements, uh, which are sensitive to H0 and omega matter. Um, so including BAO, you tighten constraints up considerably to this small little area here, which very nicely overlaps with what you get in the Lander CDM model uh, from, uh, from Planck primary anisotropies. Of course, you can play the same game with, with galaxy lensing. Um, so this is a story which is in a, a state of flux, as we, we heard about in Anthony Lewis's talk earlier. Um, let me just make uh, one point. Um, so this is comparing here Planck lensing in gray, uh, Des lensing of galaxies in green, the overlap, uh, the combination of the two in red, compared to constraints from the primary CMB in blue. Um, and the point I want to make, really, is just the different degeneracy directions here. Um, because the CMB uh, is a, uh, the lenses are typically at higher redshift than for galaxy lensing, you have less sensitivity to the matter density than you do uh, for galaxy lensing. So these contours have different degeneracy directions, so their combination um, tightens things up quite considerably. The exact placing of this galaxy lensing contour uh, depends critically uh, on your photometric redshift uh, calibration. Um, and I'm not going to say more about that, but I, I suspect we'll hear a lot about that throughout the rest of this week. Okay, <clears throat> so let me say a couple of slides about B-mode uh, delensing. Okay, so <clears throat> this is a plot again John showed earlier. So this is the B-mode power spectrum, all these current upper limits, and then measurements from ground-based experiments. And <clears throat> the thing to note is that the gravitational lensing signal from B-modes um, basically acts like additional white noise in your experiment. And it acts like five microkelvin arc minute of additional noise on the sky. And CMB experiments, particularly BICEP, Keck, uh, is an outreaching sensitivities um, where their instrument noise is lower than that lensing signal. So to make further progress, you either uh, have to observe larger fields uh, or you try and remove the lensing signal somehow. So... The way you can try and do this is via this process of delensing. Um, so the idea is that if you have some estimate of the lensing potential phi and you've measured the E modes on the sky, you can basically try and combine together E and phi to mimic uh, or simulate the effects uh, of lensing, converting E modes into B modes, subtract that template from your data, um, and then hopefully your delensed field uh, will have less power than what you started with. And how well this works basically just depends on how correlated uh, your uh, estimate of the lensing potential is to the true lensing potential. So if that correlation coefficient is rho L, uh, then uh, basically the residual power after delensing depends on 1 minus the correlation squared. So what we want to try and do is get this correlation close to 1, then we'll get rid of lots of lensing power. <clears throat> so if you look at the correlation coefficient with current data, this is for Planck. Um, <clears throat> uh, the minimum variance uh, lensing reconstruction is where the signal to noise is good, is highly correlated with the input, but unfortunately we lose signal to noise as you go to multiples L greater than about 100. And that's important because the scales that you actually care about for B mode delensing are lenses at multiples over a broad range of scales from about 100 to 1000. So with Planck at the moment, uh, we don't have the sensitivity, really, to do very effective delensing just using an internal lens reconstruction. So what do you do? Uh, well, you can try and use other stuff that's correlated with the, the CMB lensing potential. Um, and that's not as easy as it sounds, because what you want to do uh, is get control over these multiples on relatively small scales. But those tend to be lenses at high redshift. Um, so, you know, redshift greater than 2 um, so somehow you need to trace large-scale structure on those scales at, at high redshift. 
Um, what we did here is use the cosmic infrared background, uh, which uh, is actually highly correlated uh, with the lensing potential. It's very effective at filling in uh, the, the correlation coefficient to give this, uh, uh, this green uh, line here in total, which is about 60% correlated on the scales that we care about uh, with the lensing potential. So I mean, just to show you visually what's going on there, um, this top plot uh, is just the minimum variance lensing reconstruction, and then you can fill in small-scale power by adding in the CIB fluctuations. OK, so if you construct a B-mode template in that way, try and subtract it from the measured B-modes and then take the power spectrum and compare it to what you started with, um, then what you find is that we are actually able to suppress uh, the B-mode power by about 20% uh, in the Planck data uh, using this combination of the internal lens reconstruction and the cosmic infrared background. Um, this is quite interesting plot in that... Um, that Planck doesn't have the sensitivity to detect B modes on its own, right? It's just not, uh, it doesn't have the sensitivity. Um, but in this particular difference, uh, this power spectrum difference, the instrument noise cancels out to a very significant degree. Um, so you can detect this difference actually to very high significance. Okay, I'm running out of time. Um, so <clears throat> let me just say that um, uh, we can also look for lensing by individual halos uh, in the microwave background. Um, so this is an example using SPT data stacked on the position of uh, optically identified clusters uh, in DES. Um, and essentially by integrating the, the reconstructed convergence uh, around circles in this plot, you can get convergence profiles that are nicely consistent with what you expect for the lensing from a cluster. And going forward, this will be a very powerful way uh, to calibrate the masses of large samples of galaxy clusters out to high redshift. And it's very complementary to galaxy lensing, um, the problem being that you know, there's a dearth of galaxies behind these high redshift lenses, uh, between, be, behind high redshift clusters. Um, so whereas the CMB being at such a high redshift uh, is behind every cluster. OK, there, there, there's a poster by uh, Inigo Zabeldia um, who will tell you about work he's been doing uh, with Planck clusters recently using um, mass calibration from CMB lensing. Um, so I won't uh, steal his thunder, and I don't have time anyway, uh, but this is a very nice uh, result he's got uh, on the hydrostatic mass bias parameter derived from, from lensing. Okay, so just to finish up, uh, let me just say uh, that uh, what's happening in the field now is that we're going from the sensitivities of Planck uh, to more sensitive experiments on the ground. Simon's Observatory, the large aperture telescope, um, <coughs> Uh, will be in a, a range where the temperature and the polarization information will be about comparable uh, in terms of statistical power for constraining lensing. Whereas experiments like CMBS4 uh, you will be completely dominated by the polarization information because the sensitivity is so much higher. And that will be a really important uh, change um, because the astrophysical systematics in these measurements, particularly from extragalactic foregrounds, are expected to be negligible in polarization, whereas they're still a, a very significant, well, they're a significant contaminant for temperature-based reconstructions. And <clears throat> so this is where Simon's observatory will be. Um, SPT3G is actually somewhere in between these two, um, but observing over very small parts of the, the sky still. OK, so it's a very exciting uh, future, I think, for, for this field. Uh, you know, we can go from this situation to having half a million well understood linear modes uh, that we can either uh, measure their variance directly or cross correlate uh, with other large scale structures uh, or stack on objects to find cluster masses, uh, example. Okay, thank you. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. So, a few questions before coffee break. So I was wondering if it's possible to finally have something like number density of dark matter halos from the lensing from some kind of real observation experiment, because now we only have it from simulations. Yeah, I mean, you, you, you can do that. Uh, that's not what's done here, right? This is, this is stacking. Um, essentially, you make lensing maps, and then you stack them on the position of, of, 
yeah. known halos. The problem is that at, at the individual halo level, the signal to noise is really, really poor in these measurements. So in terms of finding halos, it's, it's never going to be a good way to do it unless you want to look for really extreme, rare objects. I guess. More questions? I guess everybody wants their coffee. <laughs> Thank you very much, Anthony. So we have a one hour break, which is coffee and post the session. And so we reconvene at 4.30. It's, me, it's on mute. No, I think now it's on. No, uh, it's on. No, it says mute. So. Wait. Now it's on. Do you want it mute? Okay. Great, because we're waiting a few minutes. Sure, sure. So, are they going to switch from the AC? Uh, During. So, uh, welcome back, and uh, we start uh, the afternoon session with a talk by Anja von der Linden on cosmology with galaxy clusters. Okay, thank you. Where's the rest of the people? <laughs> All right, sure. Um, well, I was going to thank the organizers for inviting me, um, but they're not here. Um, thank you for coming to the, the last session of the day on this hot day. All right, so I was asked about to talk specifically about challenges with cluster cosmology. And, um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a sales pitch of two slides of why you should listen to me, even though cluster cosmology is difficult. And part of that is cluster cosmology works. I keep reading in many abstracts, oh, but clusters are in tension with, uh, with the lambda CDM model or the CMB uh, temperature anisotropies. That is actually specific to the analysis that was published by the, by the Planck team. Analysis, other analyses that try to self-consistently model both cosmology and the scaling relations, as well as to account for selection effects, they're actually in good agreement uh, with, uh, with the lambda CDM model from primary anisotropies. But eyeball, you can eyeball this and say that, okay, but clusters can also not tell where we are between C and B and the results that we've seen, say, from cosmic shear. So if you think this is boring, I also want to point out that we do really well in extensions to the Lambda CDM model. And so in the Wying the Giants project, we put a constraint on W that's one of the tightest constraints on single probes and actually quite comparable to the power of the DES 3 cross 2 point analysis. I will say that much of what I'm going to talk about is kind of biased from my view of, uh, of the weighing the giants analysis, but I will try to be a bit more general. The second slide of my sales pitch is that clusters are statistically very powerful probe of cosmology. This is a statistically uncertainties only <laughs> forecast for W first. I'm sorry, I couldn't find this plot for Euclid. Um, but anyway, you know, same thing. We measure cosmic shear, gl galaxy clustering, and galaxy clusters. And so here the yellow contours are from clusters. And you'll see that they are much smaller than the statistical only constraints on cosmic shear or galaxy clustering. Now, of course, we're we are not going to be limited by statistics. We'll be lim we will be in the systematics dominated era of cosmology. In fact, we already are. And so you should take this with a large grain of salt. For clusters, uh, the most important systematics will come in through the mass measurement. And I'm going to elaborate on this through much of the talk. Here's the outline of what we want to do. It's the cartoon picture. 
So pretty standard n-body simulation. We start from a fairly smooth density field. Um, and structure collapses into ever more massive halos. And I've asked my simulator friends to put a, put a colored circle around each halo each time it passes a certain mass threshold. I'm going to play this movie again. So we start from basically no massive halos, and then we start with, with low mass halos, and those merge to form more massive halos. Over here, we're keeping track of the number of halos as a function of their mass. This is called the halo mass function. And in cluster cosmology, we want to measure the halo mass function as well as its evolution with redshift. Because you can see, if you imagine that you had added more dark matter to the simulation, then the structures would form faster. That means the halo mass function would evolve quicker. If you add more dark energy, dark energy drives things apart. It will slow the growth of structure. If you add neutrinos, if you change the laws of gravities, you can change the shape of this function and you can change the way that it assembles. So clusters are very sensitive to pretty much all of the cosmological parameters. One thing to point out here is that clusters are both a geometrical probe, because we measure the number of clusters in a volume, and of course, by definition, they're also a probe for the growth of structure. The ingredients that we then need for cluster cosmology are, well, we need those predictions from simulations, about the halo mass function, function of cosmology. We need to go and find a bunch of clusters. However, clusters, this is the halo mass function, and we do not observe mass in our cluster surveys. So we need a way to relate our observables uh, to the mass of the halos in the simulations. Now, put a bunch of arrows here. What the arrows mean is that, if you think about it, this is an X-ray survey, and I'm plotting X-ray luminosity here. That's not actually our measurement. Our measurement is an X-ray flux plus a redshift, and we need to assume a cosmology to convert that to a luminosity. The SE signal to noise and optical regions are less sensitive to cosmology, but they're also defined in apertures, which means that they are sensitive to cosmology. And so what you really need to do is solve all of these parts of the puzzles simultaneously. All right, and I put in some slides about challenges. I'm not going to talk much about the simulations for the halo mass function, just saying that in the future we're going to have to do, we need much more accurate and much more precise predictions of the shape of the halo mass function in different cosmologies, properly accounting for the effect of baryons. Right now this is not a systematic uncertainty, but for the Euclid and LSST era, we're going to have to do better than we know now. The next step then is finding clusters. And we do best in finding clusters via their baryonic mass constituents. So in X-rays, we can find clusters as being extended extragalactic emitters. What we see is thermal radiation from the intracluster medium. In SE, we detect clusters by the same mass component. We detect them uh, with the sonyaev zeldovich effect, that is inverse Compton scattering of CMB photons on the hot intracluster medium. We can also use optical or near infrared and trace the galaxy populations, that is, identify clusters as over densities of galaxies. Next challenge. Wait a minute, I'm talking about cluster finding. However, in the simulations, we're finding halos. In the future, we're going to have to be more careful about that these things are not necessarily the same. Even in the simulations, if we run different halo, if we run different halo finders, we get slightly different halo mass functions. This already adds an uncertainty of a few percent on the predictions of the halo mass function. And so these algorithms differ in most of the clusters, say 80%, it's pretty easy, there's one cluster. 20% are train wrecks, think of the bullet cluster. Is it one cluster, is it two clusters? Different halo finders um, will make different decisions about what is one cluster, what is several clusters. The same is true for cluster finders, right? When do you think it is one cluster, when is it two clusters? So in the future, we're going to have to be more careful about how we map one onto the other. What we, what we need for this are going to be large simulations that accurately predict the properties um, of halos in their cluster observables. So it's not something that we have now. OK, then we come to measuring masses. As you saw from the second motivation slide, this is actually the biggest challenge. To repeat, our survey observables well, that's optical richness, X-ray luminosity, the SE signal-to-noise, 
don't actually measure the cluster mass. All of these quantities, they correlate with cluster mass in the sense that on average, if you have more galaxies, then you probably also live in a more massive cluster. But all of them have considerable scatter of the order of 20 to 40 percent. Fortunately, we don't actually need to know the mass of every single cluster in the survey. All we need is, all we need to know is how to describe the population that is given a true mass m in the, in the simulations, what is the probability uh, of the observable? I should point out here is that true mass is what comes from the simulations, that is 3D over density masses. Okay, the simplest assumption is that clusters lie that on average, the mean of the observables in bins of mass follows a power law relation. That is, if we plot things on a log log plot, it's a straight line. And this is reasonably well motivated. However, we now have this intrinsic scatter of 20 to 40 percent. So what happens with the scatter and when we do our survey? Well, this is what happens. This is a toy realization where I've taken this mean relation and a halo mass function, meaning that there's more low mass halos than massive halos, and these scatter up. But then in every survey, we have a selection where we say we select clusters above a certain threshold with an X-ray luminosity, as the signal to noise or in richness. And so all we have is the blue points. You can already tell that the blue points don't really look like the black line. Let me talk about the scatter. Uh, so for the three methods, there are some different causes of that scatter. So in all of them, we have observational scatter. So down here near the threshold, some just scatter up or down because of observational noise. In SC and optical, we think that the scatter is mainly driven by triaxiality. That is, clusters are not actually round. They are, um, let's say, prolite ellipsoids. And so you will overestimate your observable if you see the cluster line the line, along the line of sight. So within a given aperture, you're going to count more galaxies in this case and in that case. And so we think that both for optical and for SC, this is the largest contribution to the scatter. In X-rays, the scatter is entirely driven of whether you have a cool core or not. This is a plot of surface brightness of two clusters. And uh, well, sometimes a cluster has a cool core in the center, but sometimes it's not. But you can see that the presence of a cool core makes a cluster much, much brighter. So these effects are what drive clusters to be away from the mean line and to scatter up and into your sample or to scatter down. And while I keep showing this plot, when we do a cluster survey, we don't actually have that plot, okay? The only thing we get in our cluster survey is our observables. So the only thing that we can do with the survey data itself is say we make a histogram, how many clusters in bins of, in bins of observables do we have? And from this figure, you'll understand that in each bin we'll have, well, we have a few down scattered clusters. We have some clusters on the mean relation and we really have a lot of clusters that scattered up. So what we need to do to, to do cosmology is to reconstruct what this relation is. And the uncertainties in the mass observable relation are currently the dominant source of systematics in cluster cosmology, and they will probably also stay the dominant systematics in cluster cosmology. So how do we go about this? This is where I tell you about the way joints approach, which worked really well. And it has two components. One of them is that, fortunately, there's such a thing as low scatter mass proxies. What these are is that you can take your clusters and you observe them with, um, with follow-up instruments that give you a mass proxy which has much, much lower scatter with true mass. The ones that we know are mainly in the x-rays. So this is an example for gas mass. So it's gas mass and true mass, and you see there's very little scatter. For gas mass, we've also checked this observationally. And so for these low scatter mass proxies, the scatter is actually less than 10%. This is very helpful because imagine now you follow up some of the clusters in your sample with these low scatter mass proxies. You can then reconstruct what is, what is this line, okay? Yes, there's still a challenge here. You still have to take into account the selection biases. 
But this is something that statisticians have solved for us. This is called truncated regression. However, these low scatter mass proxies, they're only that, they're mass proxies. They don't give us the absolute mass. And so we still need something that will anchor uh, this relation that we can measure from the low scatter mass proxies. So we need to measure absolute masses. That means we need observables that relate to the gravitational potential. And we really have three objects, hydrostatic masses, galaxy dynamics, and gravitational lensing. Hydrostatic masses are also X-ray follow-up observations where we assume that the clusters are spherically symmetric and in hydrostatic equilibrium. And I think the next speaker is going to talk a lot about hydrostatic mass bias. So let me just summarize that from simulations. We expect that these masses to be biased. We also have a very practical problem, which is that if we observe the same cluster with Chanda or XMM, we measure different temperatures for these, um, which actually results in different masses. Temperature differences of 20% um, cause 30% offsets in hydrostatic masses. So I'm not an X-ray astronomer. But I'd say if they disagree by this much, I probably cannot trust either one of them. So hydrostatic masses are out. Galaxy kinematics, so say velocity dispersions in the simplest assumption. Um, there's similar assumptions as in the hydrostatic mass bias. You need to assume equilibrium. But also, again, on a practical level, different implementations of measuring masses based on velocities have tended to have very large scatter but they're also very different. Okay? They depend very much on who implemented that algorithm. This is index, so 0.3 is a factor of 2. So this would be a scatter of 100%. That brings me to gravitational lensing, where we use that mass, that light deflect, where we use the deflection of light to estimate cluster mass. We can do this in the optical. I know that people are going to talk more about optical weak lensing. Um, or we can do it with uh, CMB lensing, as we heard from Anthony before. Strong lensing is not suited because it only measures mass on very small radii. So, lensing masses. What lensing measures really well is the mass projected along the line of sight. So, really what we get is mass is two-dimensional masses in a cylinder. To relate to the halo mass function, we need to uh, convert these to three-dimensional masses. Weak lensing is very noisy. At most, we can measure one parameter reliably. And so we do what all good physicists do, is we assume clusters are circularly symmetric, fit an NFW profile. We say this is the mass. However, as I said before, our clusters are actually more triaxial, that is ellipsoid. And so the projected mass depends not only on the 3D overdensity mass, but also on the shape of the cluster, and the orientation along the line of sight. Again, if the ellipsoid is oriented along the line of the sight, we overestimate the mass. If it's in the plane of the sky, we underestimate it. And so because of this, these 3D inferred lensing masses have an intrinsic and irreducible scatter of 20%. Okay? So that's not actually better than our observables. So the question then is, how about the average lensing masses? Um, is that unbiased, or rather, can we calibrate it well? Unfortunately, the answer is, is yes, something we can do fairly well with n-body simulations. We find that the NFW profile is a good description only to the very radius. However, the remaining mass bias is small, so of the order of a few percent. This is something that we have to quantify um, quite precisely to do cluster cosmology. OK, so we're going to go with gravitational lensing as our anchor. Um, because these other two have issues, a big argument for using weak lensing is also that it, it comes with a bunch of surveys. Okay? It's going to come with Euclid, with LSST, and it comes with the CMB surveys. So you could say, OK, do we still need those x-ray measurements? Yes, we do. Um, if, you, if you play the thought experiment, can we use only weak lensing? All you can do from your survey observables is, is uh, take the average in survey observable. And on our toy plot here, this means that the average in this bin is here, the next one is there, and there. These do not lie on the true relation. Now, you can correct for that if you know what the slope and the scatter is. 
Okay, so this is where the low scatter mass proxies come back in. You need them to measure the slope and the scatter, and then you can correct your, me your mean weak lensing measurements. Something that we've kind of ignored is exactly what I said before. Clusters are triaxial. That means that the clusters that scatter up are, are the ones that are overpresented by clusters that are aligned along the line of sight. So this affects our selection, but it also affects our weak lensing masses. So this is something that needs to be modeled. We think it's a large effect in optical. It probably is an effect in SC. In X-ray, it's so argued because the scatter is driven by cool cores. It's likely only a small effect. Let me summarize what I think is the state of the art uh, for cluster cosmology. So what I set this up is that what you really, the ideal case, you want to do a hierarchical model where you sort of consistently model the scaling relations, including the mass observable relation and the effect of cosmology on the measured number counts. So we need the predictions for the halo mass function. We need our survey data. We then need these low scatter mass proxies, plus we need lensing. We put all of this into a large inference framework, and out we get cosmology plus scaling relations, where this is the scaling relation between true mass and observable. This is what we reconstructed. This is where the data points are. See how the selection bias drives to model up. But we also need the relation between the lensing masses and the low scatter mass proxies. But with these, we also get pretty awesome cosmology. To date, there's three-ish studies that have used a framework like this. Weighing the giants, uh, with our paper from 2015, uses roughly 200 clusters selected in X-rays. These still come from ROSAT. ROSAT flew a while ago, but it took us a while to get there. We have a wealth of follow-up data, 50 with weak lensing, roughly 90 with Chandra imaging for the low scatter mass proxies. Uh, and I should say that this actually goes back to Adam Mansell's works from 2010 without the lensing, and in weighing the giants, we added the lensing anchoring. Uh, recently, we've also seen a very similar analysis done with the SPT SC clusters, and Tim Schaubach is going to talk about that. And now, something similar has also been done for the Planck clusters. Uh, we're going to have, I think, I'm going to hear a flash talk by uh, Zubelia. Um, this is similar, but not quite the same because it doesn't use the low scatter mass proxies. That is, it still uses external data to kind of fix, to fix the scatter and to put an informative prior on the slope. However, all three of these you'll see are actually in good agreement with a Planck CMB. To go beyond lambda CDM, um, in the Wang and Giants and the SPT study, we go beyond and measure several parameters. So I've talked about the constraints from W from Wang and Giants. It's quite tight. It's less tight uh, from SPT. What this mainly reflects is that measuring scaling relations for high redshift clusters is way more difficult than at low redshifts. Both studies have also put constraints on neutrino masses, modified gravity, etc. So here, the neutrino mass constraint, they're not the greatest number out there. However, they're actually pretty good if you start to vary not just one parameter away from lambda CDM, but, uh, but two. So if we're ever in a position that we want to measure W and neutrinos, then clusters actually do quite well. Somebody said, oh, blinding, do we need it? Clusters, we absolutely need it, okay? These are the big and famous clusters. Every cluster person has an opinion of which cluster should have which mass. Um, so in weighing the giants, we, we, we blinded all the cluster masses and developed the techniques without knowing the answers. Blinding requires extensive testing, but also builds confidence that your results are reliable. And this was good because the first unblinding we did was to lensing masses with respect to previous studies. We found that our masses were higher than previous works. But because of the experience here, we were able to say why the other studies uh, were biased low. And most of these have come up uh, to be consistent with our masses. So let me briefly talk about the future of cosmology. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have a lot of surveys at many wavelengths. As I just argued, you can actually learn a lot if you have multi-wavelength tracers. <laughs> 
We're going to have cluster catalogs from, from optical, x-ray, and the Z, new cluster catalogs. Um, I've not really shown optical constraints, but optical cluster catalogs are highly complete. However, they have pretty large scatter because of projection effects and triaxiality. Optical, but optical is definitely necessary to give you the redshift of clusters and the BCG as a tracer of the center. X-ray and the Z select on the hot gas. The Z is great because it has the smallest scatter and it's sensitive out to high redshifts. So here are projections. These are current cluster counts from, from SVTSC, from Planck and ACT, but here are projections for CMB stage four. And you'll see that it's essentially mass limited out to, out to high redshifts. Here's also the curve for Erosita, launching, well, unfortunately not last Friday, but in July. Um, as Erosita will mainly find clusters at lower redshifts, but the nice thing about the X-ray selection is that it's not susceptible to triaxiality. Okay, then we need to go and measure weak lensing masses. We're gonna have Euclid, we're gonna have LSST, we're gonna have W first, we're gonna have CMB, so this will be good for, for measuring lensing masses. Of course, we inherit all of the systematic um, that affect cosmic shear, okay? All of the systematic that are related to me shear measurements and to photo Zs propagate forward to clusters. In some cases, they're even harder in clusters. So the shear measurements, one, in clusters, we're gonna encounter blending. This, of course, is a much bigger concern for LSST and for the space-based probe. Uh, but we also have higher shear. So we have to worry more about shear-dependent selection effects. In photo Zs, it really helps if we're able to select a clean sample of background galaxies. And so this is where combining the LSST optical plus the near infrared will give us much better control for photometric redshifts and the selection of galaxies. Somewhere above redshift of one, maybe 1 1.5, CMB lensing will actually be more powerful than optical lensing. Basically in optical lensing, we're gonna run out of galaxies but also we're approaching a Z of two where CMB lensing is most effective. All of lensing, however, will have to put a lot more work in the mass modeling that is measuring the mass bias due to not having the right cluster centers, um, or assumptions on the halo shape, whether it's NFW or not, uh, triaxiality, et cetera. So weak lensing will be hard. This is mainly what I work on, the cluster weak lensing, um, but I think we can do it. I'm actually more worried about the low scatter mass proxies. The reason for that is so we absolutely need them to measure the shape of the mass observable relation. Um, however, we have very limited tools. Erosita will be very important because it's going to measure gas masses for the brightest clusters in the sky, but that means they're mainly limited to the local universe. The next generation of large X-ray telescopes that can actually reach the clusters at Z of one will only be launched in roughly 2030, okay? So while we have CERN and XMM, it's actually quite important that we spend time um, on following up the high redshift clusters. And my summary is that clusters are a very powerful probe of cosmology. It's very challenging to do cluster cosmology, but with the combination of low scatter mass proxies and weak lensing, I think we're in pretty good shape. And I'm looking forward to having a lot of multi-wavelength data sets to study clusters. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, questions? Here's one, George. Okay, um, why bother going through masses and intermediate steps? Why don't I just <laughs> do simulations, you know, predict, the SZ observable and do the comparison against simulations? So I, I hear that question quite often, um, including from simulators. Um, it's really hard, okay? Um, part of, let me, let me go back to, right. So, right, so if we were able to accurately simulate our sky, including clusters, that would work. However, we can't do that yet. There is no large scale simulation that can do both the end body plus accurately predict um, the properties of, uh, of clusters. Um, in the Euclid simulations, if you ask anybody in the cluster working group, they will tell you 
how those, I think, galaxy density profiles were messed up. In the LSST simulations, the red sequence galaxies have a different color than in the clusters than in the field. Okay? It's really hard to get that right. If we want to do X-ray and SC, um, we have to get the hydrodynamics right on really large scales. The other part is that we have something that is extremely useful. Right? These low scatter mass proxies, they, they go with this, uh, this definition of a spherical halo, a spherical mass over density, which comes out of somewhere. And as an observer, you would say, oh, but, but I mean, this thing is elliptical. Why should I pay attention to spherical over density mass? The reason is that we have observables that trace that very well. And this is something extremely valuable. And this is, um, this is how we can use this in this context. I should say, in shear only, you could go to the sky directly, and then it becomes thing, and then it becomes something different. That's uh, the, peak, the shear peak statistics, but it's not the same as as the halo mass function. Yeah, satisfied, George. Uh, more questions? No. Then let's thank Anya again. <laughs> and the next talk will also be on cluster cosmology, Planck cluster cosmology this time, and Marianne Duspice will do the honors. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'll continue on this uh, cluster section, talking about the Planck SZ clusters and Planck SZ for cosmology. Obviously, this is a present presentation done with some uh, work done by the Planck collaboration, but also more recently with uh, some collaborators at uh, IAS. Uh, one of uh, them is in, in the room, Laura, uh, as well. So I'll start directly by this uh, plot, which uh, for what uh, SZ clusters for Planck are known. Uh, so I will discuss briefly how we did find this uh, tension, what's new since 2013, and I will uh, talk a bit of some of the systematics and especially the evolution of the mass bias. So uh, I don't have to convince you that Planck is an exquisite SZ machine, uh, thanks to these uh, nine frequency uh, probing the different frequency bounds to reconstruct the SZ signature. You have here an example of uh, Abel 2319, where you clearly see the decrements be below 217, the null at 217, and a positive uh, uh, signal above. Obviously, uh, this is not the case for all clusters. The signal is really weak, so you have to make a dedicated uh, cluster finder. Uh, we did that in three different releases in 2011, 13, and 15, and ended up with something like more than uh, 1,600 uh, cluster candidates, uh, for which we have uh, more than 1,000 uh, redshifts. Uh, obviously, the, as we've seen the, this morning uh, and this afternoon, the, the SZ Planck clusters are not the only one uh, detected in SZ. Uh, the, you have here the distribution in mass and redshift of the Planck clusters compared to SPT and SCT. And all these uh, uh, clusters are compiled in a meta catalog uh, available. Uh, so obviously, we don't use all these clusters for uh, doing cosmology. We have to select uh, them. So we, did, we do a, a compromise between having a large number of clusters to have high statistics, but also a large purity. So that's why we selected like, uh, the clusters of the 65 cleanest part of the sky uh, with two different uh, uh, cuts in uh, signal to noise. In 2013, we, were, we had 189 clusters uh, cutting at signal to noise of uh, seven. And in 2015, we have like uh, more than 400 clusters uh, cutting at lower signal to noise. As was mentioned, we used uh, 71 clusters uh, inside this uh, sample to make the scaling relation uh, using X-ray data uh, in combination of SZ data. You have here the distribution of the two uh, sample. I'll briefly uh, show as well, because I will use that, uh, the fact that we can reconstruct SZ 
signal on the full sky using a dedicated uh, component separation. This is the y map, first full sky y map uh, given by Planck, which traces the warm and hot gas uh, everywhere in the sky, not only on, uh, on uh, galaxy clusters. So from this map, you can compute the angular power spectrum. And we did that on 50% uh, uh, of the sky, the cleanest 50% of the sky. And then you can uh, derive this uh, uh, power spectrum uh, with high reliability between scales from L of 10 to L of uh, 1,000. So uh, you have two probes of cosmology using SZ. Uh, the number counts. Uh, that uh, scales uh, more or less like uh, in sigma 8 omega m to the third. And you have the uh, angular power spectrum, the full map, which scales almost at the same way, with this uh, dependency on the mass bias that was uh, discussed before. So if we come back to the first plot, uh, showing the, the, the tension that we had uh, between uh, SZ and, and CMB, uh, it's actually, in terms of statistics, it's just like uh, it was 2.5 sigma, something like that. But if you look at it in terms of number of clusters, it's a factor of three between what we observed and what we should observe if we uh, think that the assumption on cluster modeling is right and the CMB cosmology is right. So it's not so uh, negligible when you see uh, these numbers instead of just uh, ellipses. So what has changed since uh, 2013? Uh, on the CMB side, we've seen uh, this morning that uh, uh, over the years, uh, we used uh, polarization from HFI with a better uh, depth estimation of the uh, realization optical depths, uh, lower value of tau, and this lower value of tau, because of the degeneracy with uh, sigma 8, end up with a smaller uh, value of uh, sigma 8 as well. So if you plot that in this uh, omega m sigma 8 uh, contours, you move from the black contours in 2013 to uh, the last, latest one in 2018 uh, in red here. On the cluster side as well, there have been some Small changes, uh, we were using, as I said, 189 clusters. Uh, the slope of the scaling relation was uh, built on the comparison with SZ and X-ray on 71 clusters, and the amplitude was determined by uh, looking at 12 different simulations, predicting the uh, hydrostatic mass bias, and this mass bias was averaged to 0.8, and we uh, took at the end some uh, flat a prior on 1 minus b between 0.7 and 1. So you have here uh, in, in blue this uh, flat prior in, in terms of 1 minus b. Later on, we used 400 clusters. We moved from this prior, uh, flat prior, in terms of uh, a, a baseline, which was CCCP lensing bias estimate of 78 plus or minus 0.1, which is the red one here. Uh, we did not include evolution of the, on, with redshift, and we used number counts not only in redshift, but also in signal to noise. So as the uh, prior on B is different, you see here that you allow some value between 0.6 and 0.7 uh, using the CCCP bias. Uh, so basically what you do is you extend your contours in the uh, upper direction, uh, going to a smaller value of 1 minus B, meaning a larger value of sigma A. So some results that we shown uh, last year uh, is that basically we moved from this situation in 2013 to this situation in 2018. So the uh, tension is much, much more uh, reduced compared to a few years ago. And the second result that we, uh, so this is even with 2018 instead of 16, uh, which is uh, almost the same. And the second result that we had is that by combining the power spectrum and the clusters number counts, uh, you uh, marginally uh, uh, constrain the bias without any prior on coming from weak lensing. And you have here sigma 8 over uh, one, uh, 1 minus b, which gives you something around 75 with a quite large error bar of 0.1. And uh, without any prior on weak lensing, you see that, again, you have this kind of uh, lower tension between the two, uh, the two problems again. So we have a situation where the, the AZ clusters plus BO wants a kind of lower value, uh, higher value of 1 minus b, but a lower value of uh, sigma 8 omega m, while the CMB when combined with TZ, wants a low value of 1 minus b and a higher value of uh, sigma 8 omega m to the third. So can we try to resolve even more this, this mm, small remaining tension between the two? Uh, so we tried, obviously, the extension of the lambda CDM. Uh, the two obvious ones are neutrino mass and uh, dark energy. Unfortunately, if you look at the 
how the contours of the CMB are moving when you allow for uh, neutrino or uh, W uh, models. Uh, they're enlarging, obviously, because we have one of more free parameters, but they're enlarging parallel to uh, the, the sigma eight omega m degeneracy of clusters. So you don't uh, reconcile more of the two. Uh, one way to do it is to consider uh, modified gravity models. Uh, by w one way is to let these uh, gamma parameters free. Uh, here it has been shown that you can, again, go to lower sigma eight for the CMB, but the cost is to have a gamma which is 0.9, which is really a huge deviation compared to uh, general uh, relativity. Uh, so is this uh, remaining uh, attention uh, significant? Well, we're below now two, two sigma in terms of cosmological parameters, so it's not so, so huge. Uh, uh, same thing for the mass bias. We kind of exclude 0.8, which is like the baseline uh, value at two sigma. The fact is that if you have too low value of one minus b, then you get in trouble in terms of baryon fraction in clusters. This is a work by Eckert et al, uh, where you see in blue the, the fraction of gas in clusters uh, evaluated when you assume uh, hydrostatic mass bias of the clusters uh, compared to the universal baryon fraction, which is 0 0.13. And if you now assume a low value of one minus b, kind of 0 0.6, like, so, like uh, the CMB wants, you have all these green points which are much lower than the fraction of gas uh, universal. So you have to explain why there is not enough gas in clusters if you have a too much, uh, too lower value of uh, one minus b. So uh, the question obviously asked uh, often after this uh, presentation is, is it a Planck problem? So obviously we looked at other probes, not notably uh, SZ probes, and it has been mentioned already that SPT has been also playing with uh, constraints on um, sigma eight omega m, for example, and you have an example here where it's uh, again marginally consistent uh, with uh, CMB. Uh, on the ACT part as well, there are some evaluation of the mass bias uh, using uh, Subaru uh, data, and this is a blue point here compared to other estimates of the mass bias, and you see that it's a bit above the 0.6 value of uh, CMB. Uh, you can play with other statistics, like one PDF for bispectrum of the SZ uh, from the map, and again, you tend to find lower value of, uh, of sigma eight. Uh, something we did as well is to cross-correlate the SZ map with the X-ray map, and again, you see that the best cosmology is lower than the one uh, from the CMB. So that is all the common things is SZ, so you can look around uh, SZ. This has been shown already. Uh, there's few estimates of uh, cosmic shear tomography uh, from KIDS, CFHTLNs, DES, reanalysis of this morning, uh, combining KIDS and DES. As we said, it's not settled down. Uh, there's like a review of several paper analysis uh, going on every, every year. So we have to see where all this converges. Uh, there's also uh, X-ray analysis from uh, X-ray uh, sample, local sample from Illigital or high mass sample from Boeinger. And all of them find uh, somehow lower value of sigma eight omega m compared to CMB. Every time it's like almost consistent at between one and two sigma, but s systematically it's lower value. There's never someone finding higher value of sigma eight compared to, to CMB. So is this uh, a signature of something going on, on, on low redshift compared to high redshift? Uh, is it really some uh, just statistical flux or not? Uh, it has to be, to be checked. So I will not discuss systematics of uh, other experiments, obviously, but I will come back on the one of, uh, of SZ, uh, because we were puzzled, as everybody, to, on, this, uh, on this fact already in 2013. Uh, as I've been shown, if you want to compute the number counts of the CLs, you need some ingredients, selection function, mass function, scaling relation, profile if you need the, for the Y map. And all of these ingredients has obviously some systematics, uh, bias, and, and errors. So we looked around a few of them. Uh, the first one was the, the, the profile. For example, we know that uh, there's less numerous cold core in SZ than X-ray, while our profile we use is uh, calibrated on X-rays. So uh, we should actually uh, sh change the, the profile. What has been shown is that the effect is really small, uh, especially in the number of clusters uh, you detect. We change the profile while detecting the clusters and the number difference is really small, especially if you cut at high signature noise for the cosmological uh, uh, sample, it doesn't have any effect. And in terms of flux, uh, it has a, a, a marginal effect for really huge clusters. Uh, 
uh, but with the 400 clusters that we are using, uh, this is uh, negligible. And we actually don't use directly the, the floods. Mass function, uh, it's known to have uh, some uncertainties, as it just been said. Uh, there's scatter between different uh, estimations. There's maybe a bionic effect as well. So one thing we tried is three different mass function from uh, Tinker, Despali, uh, and Watson. And as you see, they are almost consistent. And uh, again, shifting along this degeneracy and not going towards uh, CMP. Uh, this is the case for uh, uh, our sample of SZ, which, because there is large error bars, but it's a more drastic effect for future surveys, as was mentioned. And I encourage you to see a loudest post there, which shows exactly this effect of uh, uncertainty on the mass function. There's obviously the scaling radiation. It has been said, XMM Chandra calibration. It has been checked as well that uh, the effect is uh, much more than 10% than uh, on, uh, on our clusters. And the fact that the SPT contours are almost the same as the one uh, from Planck, uh, where the SPT is calibrated on XMM, shows that the effect is, is not so huge. Okay. Obviously, the last uh, piece of uh, systematic is the mass bias itself, the 1 minus B, which enters this scaling relation. Uh, because it's completely degenerated with uh, the co parameters you want to see, uh, sigma eight ome omega m, along this direction. Uh, it's not easy to find this, uh, the, the mass in general and this, uh, this uh, bias uh, in particular. Uh, this is a compilation of, of recent, since 2013, uh, estimation of this bias with different samples uh, using weak lensing in, in black, uh, just to be compared with what the simulations, it was most uh, recent, it was that, yeah simulation uh, are giving you, which is like uh, not more than 20% of, uh, of mass bias, hydrostatic mass bias, and uh, compared to CMB, which prefers something around 0.6. And what we find with uh, combining the two probes of SZ is something in the middle of 0.75. So it's not settled down neither. Uh, some analysis are uh, converging on, on some samples. Uh, one thing is that the samples uh, are uh, some of the samples are really sm small and maybe biased in terms of selections, like maybe uh, tracing only high mass uh, clusters and high redshift cluster, which may be not the, the representative of the sample that we have for the 400 clusters in Planck. Uh, so obviously what everybody would like is that uh, we measure the masses of the 400 clusters and we do a re proper uh, scaling relation with exactly the same clusters that we do for the cosmology. But uh, it's going on, but it's not yet. Yeah, there. Uh, so basically, this uh, 0.8 by U I was uh, referring before as being the baseline is some kind of average of all, all of this uh, uh, study of the, of the bias. I won't say more. I will be interesting now on to see if uh, the assumption that we make th that uh, we have a constant bias of a redshift and mass uh, uh, stays because uh, we have different environments. The, again, the mass bias is like hiding every physical effects that we have in clusters uh, that make any uh, difference from cluster to cluster, and that doesn't have to be the same uh, at different epoch, at different mass, where the uh, environment is different for each clusters. So something we try to look at is some uh, one minus b, which is now varying with mass, uh, with a power law in mass and power law in, in, uh, in redshift, and try to answer these two questions. Does some evolution of the mass bias help reducing the tension? Uh, and does, do we see actually in the data any uh, hint for bias evolution uh, with redshift or mass? And now, now on, when I take, talk about the data, it's the combination of TSE uh, spectrum and TSE number counts. So this should refer as just to TSE. So first question, does it help? Uh, this busy plot is showing that uh, not really. Uh, so you have uh, in, uh, in uh, blue the CMB. Uh, in uh, large, uh, in purple, what the clusters are telling you, uh, clusters and, and uh, power spectrum are telling you, if you let both the amplitude, the, the redshift and mass evolution free, so obviously it's completely enlarging the, the, the contours, but it's also moving towards uh, higher omega val value of uh, omega matter. And if you fix the amplitude to be something about 0.8, uh, letting the slope for the redshift and mass free, you have these green contours, which is like excluding the CMB or vice versa. And uh, if you try to combine the two, you have a really bad sky squared uh, of the, the, this combination. 
So it doesn't help reducing the tension to let free these, uh, these two parameters more. Uh, do we see any evolution? Uh, if you look at the TSD only, you have a slightly uh, positive value of beta, which is the evolution of, with redshift. Uh, you have here the one minus B as function of redshift for different masses. Uh, the lower mass uh, of the sample, the highest mass of the sample, and you see that it go it's going up with redshift, which is not really uh, expected. Uh, so uh, we have to go further to think uh, if it's actually uh, hiding a mass evolution, because when you go to high redshift, you look mostly at high mass clusters. So is it just uh, a conversion between the two? And how robust, uh, the first question was how robust is, is, is this uh, finding? So we tried different things. Uh, we tried different priors on the constant part of the one minus B. Uh, being a low value of uh, the bias, 0.7, CCCP as a baseline, or from numerical simulation with high value of, uh, uh, of the bias, and every time is the same, we see, we see a positive value of beta uh, slightly above one sigma or, uh, above zero. And again, if you don't assume any uh, prior uh, on, uh, except a flat prior on one minus B, you find again this value of 0.75 for the uh, normalization, and uh, you find now a value of beta which is more consistent with zero. Uh, we tried different parameterization because we, what you use is uh, power law in redshift and mass. The, the evolution has no reason to follow these laws. So what we did was three different bins in redshift and tried to compute the bias for each bin, uh, bin in redshift. And again, what you find is that the first bin at low redshift gives a lower bias than the other two. So same trends of uh, evolution of, red, of uh, bias with redshifts. So the th last thing we checked is how much this uh, finding is uh, depending on uh, of the, um, the sample that we are using. Uh, everything has been done now with the clusters and TSZ, but for the clusters we used uh, the 400 clusters. Uh, one way we, we cut the data was to uh, cut at higher signal to noise, higher uh, value of Q, going from 6, six to 8.5. And if you cut, uh, so you have less and less clusters, but the more massive ones and the more robust ones, uh, you go for higher signal to noise, and what you see is that your beta is going back to zero uh, with no evolution on redshift. But what you see as well is your alpha, which is the evolution of mass, is going away from zero. So there is kind of balancing between the two when you change the sample, uh, the, the signal to noise cut. Another test we did was to cut completely the low redshift uh, clusters. Uh, below 0.2 and redo the analysis. And here we find something which is slightly negative or consistent with zero. So which means that there may be some uh, different behavior at uh, low redshift compared to high redshift or some completeness or selection function effect at, at low redshift. So as has been said, nevertheless, uh, clusters are a good probe of cosmology. You can still use it uh, to constrain cosmological parameters. Uh, again, uh, on the sum of the mass of the neutrino, where combining the CMB in red with all the TSD uh, experiments, you won't find the blue, blue contour, so uh, st stronger constraints on the mass of neutrinos. And especially here, when you look at the dark energy, where the CMB is, has this uh, really strong degeneracy along this line in red, uh, by adding clusters, you find back your value of W minus 1 and omega uh, sigma 8, 0.8 and uh, W uh, minus 1 with uh, much smaller error bars. Obviously, there's other uh, things you can do. I will just uh, conclude because I think my time is up. Uh, so uh, first thing is that the tension between the FZ clusters, uh, Planck ones, uh, is reduced by the new uh, optical depth. Uh, we move from here to here so that there's less tension between the two. Uh, there's a mild uh, tension remaining at some level in terms of uh, value of sigma 8. Uh, we've seen large-scale structures uh, experiments. I've just tried to make a compilation here with the one I, with, for which I have the chains. For the other one, I just put the best model for, for these three. And you see that every time the value we find is uh, with smaller value of sigma eight omega n to the third, which is in going in this direction. So is it a sign of something? Is it just a statistical flux again? Uh, we, have to, uh, we may have to dig a bit more. In terms of systematics, the obvious one have been uh, discarded. Uh, the, remi the remaining one uh, are obviously the, the mass bias. I will come back. Uh, if you want to uh, 
to find a, an extension to the uh, lambda CDM that to the mo cosmological model that fits your uh, both the CMB SZ correctly, you have to go to extreme cases, uh, gravity modif modify gravity to 0.9. Uh, as I said, the constant bias has to be uh, quite big, 0.6 which is a kind of at odds with simulations and most of the weak lensing mass estimates, and also to the Bion fraction, which is half of the one that you have uh, universally. Uh, everything, uh, a bias evolving with time and re uh, with redshift or mass doesn't help at all uh, reducing the tension. And uh, what we have to do now is to test this evolution with other sample going to, for example, higher redshift uh, uh, with SPT or, or ICT or the next uh, uh, generation of uh, experiments. Still, uh, we can put strong constraints uh, using the combination of CMB and clusters. This is the case, for, for example, for W. Uh, and uh, as has been said, we, uh, as the, the conference is called from Planck to Euclid, uh, the future su survey will really probe uh, higher redshift and have more strengths uh, with cluster than we already have. Uh, multivariate studies will allow to tackle all the systematics uh, that we have. And, uh, uh, I refer to a poster from Laura again, which shows uh, the, what Euclid-like experiment can do on cosmology. Uh, and you see here the small error bars compared to, to the one we have now. And I stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Questions? No questions? Everything was perfectly clear. Yeah. Thank you, Marianne. So you, you mentioned in the middle of your talk that uh, the gas fractions at R500 were not consistent when, once you correct for the bias. Yeah, yeah. They were off by about a factor of two. Yeah. But this is at R500. Yeah, and yeah. We know that the gas fractions increase with radius. So when you go from R500 to the real radius, so the real radius is R100 at low redshift. Of course, you have high redshift clusters where the discrepancy is less small. But at low redshift, you have a factor of 5 in density. Density goes as roughly R to the minus 2.5 in an NFW at that radius. So radius goes as minus 0 0.4, and you get the factor of 2. Yeah, we are, this has to be completed depending on redshift and radius and to see if, if this R500 is just hap happened to be chosen so that it, it fits with the hydrostatic mass bias today and not with the bias. On it, but uh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, so you showed these different probes that show some mild tension with respect to Planck. Did you ever try combining them in a naive way? And what kind of tension would no, that I give us? I was tempted to do that, but uh, I, I, I don't have the likelihood of all of them. I just have sometimes uh, on, only the chains. Uh, and I don't know enough the, the correlation between the probes uh, to, to do that. But, uh, but, but you in a naive way. Na yeah. Well, but by, by I, I, <laughs> I would say that it 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 uh, shows that the the yellow kind of contours will be the the, the average of those. Things. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Marianne again. So the next talk will be by Tim Schrabach, Constraining Cosmology with Deep Weak Lensing Observations of Distant Galaxy Clusters from SPT. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? or? Is that fine? Perfect. Uh, so first, I would like to thank all of you for staying until the uh, final talk of the session, given the heat. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> right. So fair enough. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, of course, for giving me the chance to talk here about SPT cluster cosmology, and in particular, our use of weak lensing data for high redshift clusters in there. Of course, this is a big team effort, and just list the main contributors here. Um, so I'll start with a brief motivation, and then I thought I'd start with the results to draw your attention. So uh, showing the latest um, cluster cosmology constraints uh, from SPT, from the Bokeh et al. paper. And then I would go into some more detail on how we do the weak lensing measurements and what's, what's important there. And just a brief outlook. Okay, so uh, we heard a great introduction from, from Anya and also in the 
uh, the, about cluster cosmology and one key ingredient here really is an accurate weak lensing mass calibration because the cluster surveys just give us proxies for masses and we need weak lensing to constrain the absolute mass scale. Now if you're interested in dark like, energy, of course dark like, energy mostly affects the growth of structure which means you also need to probe the cluster mass function uh, as a function of redshift and that means you need to have a redshift dependent mass calibration. Okay, and uh, also one thing which I find quite quite nice is if, if you have a deep cluster survey such as um, SPT and ACT uh, and you find high redshift clusters and, and you add deep weak lensing measurements, you can use these to actually constrain large scale structure statistics around redshift one, which is somehow in between the cosmic shear constraints which mostly probe redshift 0.3, 0.4 at the moment and the CMB probing very high redshifts of course. Um, so this is the, the latest published uh, SPT cluster cosmology paper uh, which is led by Sebastian Bouquet who developed the um, uh, scaling relation and cosmology pipeline and the new thing here compared to previous SPT uh, cluster pa cosmology papers is the addition of direct weak lensing mass calibration coming both from Magellan for lower redshift clusters. This was in a separate paper led by Jörg Dietrich and then also from the Hubble Space Telescope for high redshift clusters which is in another paper which I'll talk about which I like. Okay, so the inputs to the book here at our cluster cosmology is first the, uh, the SPT cluster counts from the original 2500 square degree survey. So this is really the number of clusters you find as a function of redshift and detection significance. And this is illustrated here as a function of redshift, the cluster sample. Um, here this is basically showing the mass which you get assuming a fiducial scaling relation. And you see you get clusters out to very high redshift, basically to the highest redshifts where they exist simply because you have a a compact beam uh, which is great for detecting these high redshift clusters. Okay, so the addition which we, we put in here is the, the weak lensing data from Hubble and Magellan which is indicated in orange and, and green. So basically what we really use as inputs is the measurement of the tangential shear. So the net tangential alignment uh, around these clusters is a function of radius which we measure from the shapes of the background galaxies, okay? And of course we also need the redshift distributions of these background galaxies because lensing is a geometric effect and if you can't interpret the signal if you don't know the, the redshift distribution. Uh, then also one thing which Anya mentioned is the need for calibration of mass modeling biases for miscentering for example, uh, which is best done by basically mimicking the analysis on simulations. So that's also one input. And then Chandra measurements uh, to give it a um, low scatter mass proxy. So ah, yeah. Okay, so the assumptions are that you can uh, relate the mass to the uh, debiased as set detection significance through a simple scaling relation here which is a power law in mass, you have a normalization and then you also have a redshift dependent term uh, here where you have said is basically the redshift evolution of the Hubble parameter. And a similar scaling relation for the x-ray data and then uh, for weak lensing there's also a relation which relates the true mass to the measured weak lensing mass basically accounting for these mass modeling biases. And also the assumption is that you have, uh, of course you can have scatter in the data, so the, we assume that it's correlated log normal scatter, which is the intrinsic scatter between different observables. But then you also have measurement noise, especially for lensing, and also large scale structure projections, it's all, it's all included. So this is basically a schematic showing the scaling relation and cosmology pipeline. In brief, uh, so the key is that you simultaneously vary cosmological and scaling relation parameters because they're important degeneracies and you can't do this separately. And so what you do is essentially you compute the probability uh, for measuring the observed cluster counts and shear profiles of, of clusters uh, given these uh, cosmological and scaling relation parameters. So you see this here, you have the cluster sample uh, which you can compare, the, so the cluster abundance is compared to a model abundance here which of course depends on your cosmological parameters which then are fed to the halo mass function code and also for your particular set of scaling relation parameters which you have in your chain right now then you also get an expected uh, abundance and of course all the scatter is also in there which is important. And then the second likelihood term which is important here is the weak lensing mass calibration which is really the comparison of the measured weak lensing shear profiles to the expected shear profiles given the scaling relation parameters and, and uh, cosmological parameters. Okay, so if you do this, you of course get uh, a lot of parameters and including many scaling relation parameters and uh, the correlated scatter and so. And for some of the, them you have um, information from simulations, but mostly we try to keep the price as loose as possible and marginalize over the remaining uncertainty. Um, so this is just 
coming to the results. Uh, so basically marginalizing over the, all the nuisance parameters. Um, so this is just if you assume lambda CDM uh, with neutrino masses, and then you find here in omega meta versus sigma eight space, this is the SPT sample, which is I think in reasonable agreement with other measurements as Anya has shown, and also here you have Planck. Uh, so actually the Planck contours are a bit bigger here because this is completely marginalizing over neutrino mass. Once you fix this to the minimum allowed value, they, they shrink as you can see here. But basically, in this two-dimensional parameter space, there's, quite, there's basically very little tension uh, between SPT clusters and Planck, so at the 1.5 sigma level. Um, also, this lambda CDM model, uh, basically here at Westford parameters, provide a good fit to the data. Okay? So you can see here the, the uh, number of clusters as a function of uh, redshift, uh, or here as a function of detection significance, compared to the model prediction. Uh, the histogram is the measurement, this is the, the model and the one and two sigma uncertainties and you see that they agree reasonably well. So basically the bottom line is lambda CDM provides a good fit to the SPT data set. So now if you go to um, WCDM, uh, this is I think something Anya actually showed already in her talk. Um, so the, just this cutout here. Uh, so you see that the, the SPT sample here um, has a slight preference for more negative W, but still within two sigma, it's compatible with minus one. Uh, but of course, this is, I mean, basically all these constraints, they, they are dominated at the moment by the precision of the mass calibration from weak lensing. So it's simply because our weak lensing data sets are quite small. Once they expand, uh, a lot of these constraints will, will tighten. Okay. Um, just one thing I wanted to point out about WCDM as well is if you look, if you want to constrain W, you see it's quite degenerate here with the CSZ parameter. So if you just look at the blue contours, and that is again the redshift evolution term in the scaling relation. Okay, and that's what I mentioned in the beginning that if you want to constrain dark energy, you really need to probe the redshift dependence of your, of your cluster um, mass function. And that is very degenerate with the redshift evolution of the scaling relation. So if you want to tighten this, you need to increase your lensing data set over a broad redshift range, right? If you add more clusters, uh, more lensing data, you will shrink these parameters and, and you tighten your constraints. Okay, um, so this I think is one of the nicest figures and my, my, my personal favorite figure from the paper. Um, so this is an attempt from the SPT cluster sample to uh, obtain a quasi non-parametric tests for deviations from lambda CDM. So, we know Planck uh, I mean, constraints structure growth at very high redshift, and then you extrapolate this to redshift zero in terms of sigma eight. But of course, uh, you can also compute sigma eight at different redshifts, not redshift zero. So this, this red band here shows you the one sigma uh, band prediction from, from Planck. And uh, then what you can do with the cluster sample is split the sa cluster sample in different redshift bins, and also just take the mass calibration information from the clusters in these particular bins, okay? So essentially you can, constrain sigma eight in different redshift bins. And if you just look at the orange uh, data here, um, you see, okay, maybe two of them are, I mean, they generally are low compared to, to Planck, which is just the slightly lower sigma eight, which we've seen before. But then you can see, is there a trend with redshift, right? So this could be kind of an indication for maybe something strange going on at, at low redshifts, but we don't really see this at the moment uh, with the current uh, precision. But when we add more lensing data, those constraints will also improve, so that will, might be quite interesting in the, in the near future. Okay, uh, I should say basically Planck also is used here, but just to constrain the, the expansion history, and the sigma eight really comes from the clusters. Okay. So, uh, coming to the second part, which is a bit more on the technical details, how we can improve the lensing mass calibration at high redshifts. Uh, so th again, the reason is that cluster properties change. Okay, clusters are dynamically younger at high redshift, so we can't just extrapolate scaling relations from low redshifts to high redshifts and assume that we get accurate cosmology. But instead, we really need lensing data over the full redshift range of interest. At low redshifts, we can do this quite well now also with the ongoing wide area big lensing surveys like DS and KIPS and HUC. Um, but you see, um, the, this is shown in this figure here, that the efficiency, uh, the signal to noise in the lensing measurements drops quite rapidly with cluster redshift. So this factor, essentially proportional to the uh, signal to noise you get for, for, an for an individual cluster. And you see, basically you get good signal to noise here for low redshift cluster, but once you go to redshift one, uh, with for example DS steps, you, uh, you have very little sensitivity. But what you want to use are, are much deeper uh, lensing data sets which have high resolution. 
And why is this important? Well, if you have a cluster at redshift one, you essentially need sources at redshift two to constrain their weak lensing signal from, from galaxy lensing. And those tend to be small and faint, and you need deep and high resolution data to measure their shapes, okay? And so one way, for example, is to use HST, but also uh, deep data from, from Euclid and LSST will be uh, powerful here. Uh, you also need an efficient selection of these background galaxies. That's another challenge. Um, because, of course, foreground and cluster galaxies just dilute your signal. And uh, if you talk about high mass, high redshift clusters, those, of course, are rare on the sky, okay? I mean, they are very sensitive to cosmology, but you have very few of them. So for them, you really want to get the tightest constraints possible. So it makes sense to follow them up individually, let's say, with HST to get type measurements for these clusters. Uh, of course, you can't do this to lower masses because then you, uh, yeah, you need too much time. But those at lower masses, you would use... Uh, uh, what uh, future wide area data such as LSST or Euclid. Okay, so this is just an example now from the input data to uh, the Bouquet et al. paper. So this is just uh, one cluster here from a sample of 13 SPT effect clusters with a median redshift of 0.9. So this is a two by two Hubble mosaic, which we use for the shape measurement. You see the cluster here in the center with the, with the zoom out. And uh, so basically with such HST data, you can measure weak lensing shapes to like 26 magnitude roughly, um, which gives you a decent uh, density of background sources, but you still need to select them and in an efficient way. And how do we select the background sources? Um, so here it's important to realize if you do optical weak lensing and you want to have a source at redshift two, you only see the source if it's basically a blue star forming galaxy, right? If it's a red dusty galaxy, a red galaxy at redshift two, you won't see it in the optical. And that's why uh, most of the interesting high redshift sources basically are, are blue. So this is shown here. This is uh, basically using candles data. Um, the photometric redshift of galaxies versus the V minus I color, so the observed optical color. And you see most of your interesting redshift two, redshift three sources tend to be very blue. So you can actually quite efficiently select them just with, here just with a single color. And that's actually also removing basically all the cluster galaxies which live here. And that's quite helpful because, um, because, you, because with this cut, you get rid of the cluster galaxies. And that allows you to really just use these reference data like candles to infer the source redshift distribution, <coughs> okay? because you've removed the cluster galaxies already. Um, so and that, that's maybe also a scheme which, which can be interesting to push this kind of measurements also for uh, future data sets like um, HSC or LSST. OK, so the, the question which I get a lot is, can we calibrate the source redshift distribution at 26 magnitude? Okay. So I'm sure tomorrow Hendrik will talk about challenges for calibrating redshift distributions for, for kids, for example, uh, I guess. Um, and then the question is, can you actually do this two magnitudes fainter? And for, for the cluster lensing, what we're doing here, the answer is we actually can do this. And the reason is that there are actually very well-studied fields for this kind of purpose, especially um, candles. Um, candles has um, there are five fields on the sky which have been studied with very deep optical and near infrared observations from the ground in HSD and also there's a lot of very deep spectroscopy also from HSD and it already covers enough area that we can beat down sampling variance okay because we go deep then sampling <coughs> variance doesn't have such a big impact anymore and so actually this is a very useful data set um, it turns out you still need to account for systematic errors in the photometric redshifts for example here um, we've been using photoses from uh, the 3D HST team, and uh, we've been checking them with even deeper data, which you have, for example, in the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which overlaps. And if you do this comparison here, this is just the um, 3D HST redshift versus the uh, HUDF redshifts uh, after the color selection, and you see a lot of galaxies are on the one-to-one -one line, which is fine, but then you have some issues with catastrophic outliers and redshift focusing, which you need to account for. We now have a scheme which we think can correct this to about the 3% level, which is completely sufficient for, for current studies. And then what you also need to do is to match your noise properties in the cluster fields and these um, reference fields. And also one thing, for example, to do is to account for the impact of magnification. Okay, so that's something which is often overlooked, but actually because you have a broad redshift distribution in your sources, uh, the clusters actually magnify those galaxies, and that's a redshift dependent effect. And so basically, redshift two and a half galaxies are more magnified than redshift 1.4 galaxies. So that's effectively squeezing the redshift distribution a little bit. Okay, so that was quite technical. Let me just show you some results. So this is some of the scaling relation constraints we got, for example, here mass versus temperature. 
which you see is very noisy because it's pretty few clusters and the data is still quite noisy, so we need to increase the samples. At the moment, we have about a 20% constraint on the mass scale at redshift point 0.9, but there's much more data coming which will allow us to shrink these uncertainties. Um, one way to do this is actually not to use Hubble, because one problem with Hubble is if you want to do this and you need mosaics, and you want to do this for a 100 cluster, you can try to sell this to the tech, but this is pretty hopeless. Um, there's an alternative which we explored here in another paper, which is actually using ground-based observations, but in the K-band. So that, that sounds a bit strange. Why would you use the K-band? Uh, the reason is that the point spread function is much sharper. Okay? In the near infrared, so you get 0 0.3, 0 0.4 arc seconds seeing very regularly. Also, um, if you use VLT, the near infrared imager has a big field of view, so you no longer need mosaics, so you, you gain in efficiency a lot. And also one nice thing is that actually the high redshift galaxies are rounder intrinsically in the near infrared than in the optical, which reduces your noise in the measurement as well. You have a very efficient background selection, and it turns out that if you do this approach, it's about as efficient for massive clusters at these redshifts than, than using HST. So this is our preferred approach for, for massive clusters at these redshifts now. And this is just a demonstration using one particular very massive cluster here, the mass reconstruction, and this is this tangential shear profile I talked about before. So, um, one more slide on, on this uh, approach with Hawkeye, just to show you that you can really effectively select these high redshift source galaxies, uh, just with two colors in this case. Um, so basically, this is in G minus Z versus Z minus K color space, which is, which is similar to the BCK selection, which you probably know from galaxy evolution. And you see that all the blue and magenta galaxies here are very well separated from the foreground and cluster galaxies which live here which means that you get a very clean selection of the background galaxies, and that also reduces your systematic uncertainties on the, on the redshift calibration. Okay, so let me just, uh, in the final minutes, say a few words on what's coming next year. So um, we have some papers in preparation, which will hopefully come out soon. So one thing includes an expanded uh, Hubble analysis at, at similar redshifts where on the one hand we have v deeper VLT data for some of the previous clusters because that has been one of the main limitations that our color measurements weren't deep enough. But also we have uh, quite a few n uh, new clusters with HST observations. Then also Fatima Ryan has been working on uh, in more in-depth investigation of this issue of the catastrophic redshift outliers. And uh, Beatrice Hernandez-Martin has been working on one of the issues Anya mentioned uh, is the cluster shape calibration, the shear measurement calibration in the cluster regime where you have stronger shears and you have increased blending. And uh, it turns out that for the, the current work we're doing, this is a very small effect, but indeed for future work like LSST and, and uh, Euclid, we need to account for this properly. Okay, and then a little bit further down the line, uh, we have more things coming. So, um, Hannah Zoren, who actually is in the audience, is, uh, complete, is working on, a, on the analysis of our latest HST data set. So these are clusters at very high redshift, above 1.2. So there you really need to use HST if you want to do this with galaxy lensing. Um, of course, CMB lensing is a different story. We heard about that before. Um, we have an ongoing program now with VLT to explore this new approach with Hawkeye for, for 16 clusters. Um, hopefully that sample is completing this year. It's been ongoing since last year, and we would also like to expand on this further in the future if the tech gives us more time. And they're very... Uh, complementary efforts going on at low redshift to improve the constraints, both with DES and, and KIDS data. And uh, this is just one example from this, this Hawkeye program, so redshift 0.8 cluster, where you see the lensing mass reconstruction, so you do detect clusters there um, individually. Okay, uh, and one other thing which um, is going on is Martin Sommer is also working on a revised mass modeling calibration. So that's just the final thing. If I have two more minutes, one more minute? Okay, great. So um, that's something Anya also uh, mentioned the need for improved work on simulations. And let me just explain this in a little more detail. So what we've been doing is uh, to, to fit our uh, shear profiles with simple models, like an NFW model, in a certain fit range, but then you have biases which can come in, okay? Because clusters in reality are not just spherical and round, but you have variations in density profiles, you have variations in concentrations. This is a nonlinear fit, essentially, so this can introduce biases. Okay, and the, uh, a similar effect is miscentering. And you need to account for this, and the way this has been done in a number of studies now is basically mimic the analysis on the data, from the data on simulated clusters from embodied simulation. 
Um, there are a few challenges which have been ignored so far, which I think need to be addressed for the future. One is, for example, the impact of baryons also on the concentration. I think Anya mentioned also the impact on the, on the halo mass function, but also actually baryons cannot change our cluster concentrations, and if we don't match this in the simulation, we can bias our mass measurement by a few percent. Okay, and another issue is miscentering. So um, here the problem is that we never know really where to put the center of our shear profile. Okay, people use proxies like the X-ray peak or the BCG, uh, but those of course are miscentered compared to the 3D halo mass center. And uh, you need to account for this because that biases your masses. One way which people have been doing typically is compare X-ray and BCG centers and say, okay, this is a miscentering distribution. That's probably similar to my miscentering distribution that I care about. But what, uh, what we really care about is X-ray or BCG versus most bound particle. Okay, and that's, that's what we don't have at the moment. Um, and there are also important covariances. And you can see this here, for example, in this mass reconstruction of El Gordo. So in red, maybe you can see it is the X-ray center, the cyan is the SZ center. And uh, typically what you would say is that this is just randomly offsetted from this true 3D halo center. I mean, this is a very massive cluster, so we get a detailed mass reconstruction, and you see there are two peaks in the mass map, and this one is the more uh, pronounced one, so probably this is pretty close to the 3D mass center. Uh, but in the previous approach, you would just assume that the X-ray or set is in a random direction from this center. But what you see is actually between this center and the other secondary center. And that's completely ignored at the moment, and this, this covariance actually also biases your measurements. And so the way to solve this, I think, is also to repeat these measurements on hydro simulations where you have all the observables and then try to do consistency checks with the real data. Okay, thank you. I think my time is up now, so let me just put up my main conclusions. Uh, suitable deep galaxy cluster samples are available and rapidly expanding. Anya has mentioned this. We need deep, uh, well, deep lensing data to calibrate them over the full redshift range. For high mass, high redshift clusters, we can do this with pointed follow-up quite efficiently. Once you go to lower or intermediate mass clusters, they are too numerous and there it's more efficient to use the wide area deep lensing surveys or, at, of course, in the future, also the CMB lensing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, the last questions of the day. Um, <clears throat> I find it really frustrating that, you know, you've given a talk and you've said Lambda CDM, you know, fits the number counts. The previous talk, there's a deficit of a factor of three. I mean, it's very confusing for a, a you know, non-expert like me. Well, so, so my question is, if I ask you to be critical of the previous speaker, what would you say? That's... <laughs> That's a difficult question. I mean, I think one thing which really is important to do this all fully self-consistent with scaling relations and cosmology, and uh, because you have covariances, and at least this has not been captured in all previous studies, okay? So, and, and there you can do simplifications, and some of them don't affect you, some do, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to point to, to, well, I mean, I'm just saying that the SPT sample is consistent with Planck, okay? The errors are still large, we get more lensing data, which, I mean, at the moment, we're not limited by the size of the cluster sample. It's really the, the, the lensing mass calibration, which is a limiting factor. So if, if we, I mean, we're getting tighter constraints soon, and then we can maybe see if there's a tension or not. But I don't know. That's not answering your question, I guess. Does uh, Marian want to say something, Marian? Uh, yes, please. No, he, he's not here. Oh, there you are, no? Okay, more questions? We have desperate flapping of uh, things. If not, let's thank uh, our speaker again and thank all you. the speakers of the day. Thank you very much. So on the practical side, we'll be opening the bar in about half an hour. So you have time to cool off and first take some water before jumping on the wine and get t totally drunk immediately. Point one, point two, we were very disappointed when the machine came in because these idiots gave us a, a diameter, which of course uh, is not the one they deliver.
So now some, we have to do a little bit of something before turning it on and so on. But it's, yes, duct tape, but it cannot be done on the other side and we couldn't. So anyway, the machine is there, it's working. So I think tomorrow, hopefully, it's gonna be a little bit cooler. Well.